So, we're beginning today with mindfulness of being cold. <laughs> it's quite a nice experience. It's interesting. With the, the basis of mindfulness is trying to look and see what things are without entering into too much judgment of them. And with things like cold, especially if we're used to environments being warm, there's a sort of feeling, first of all, maybe it shouldn't be like this, or it should be something else, and then maybe I don't like it. And of course, as soon as we have the I don't like it, it blocks us seeing what it is. Very interesting experience to be cold. Okay, so, good morning. <laughs> Here we are. We've got a bit of time to look at mindfulness from various points of view. Uh, perhaps we begin just with a little bit of quiet sitting, just to arrive. The simplest way to do that is just to sit in a simple way, erect, allowing the skeleton to hold your weight. And as a focus or attention, you can... Uh, Experience the sensation on your upper lip of the breath going in and out at the end of the nostrils. And just form a simple intention to focus on that. This is what I'm going to attend to. And whenever the mind wanders off, caught up in thoughts or other sensations, as soon as you recognize that, you gently bring it back. That's all. That's all we're doing. Having a simple focus in order to calm the mind by not following after whatever arises. <coughs> we'll do that for about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. <coughs> There are some cushions down at the front if you want. Okay, so <clears throat> the focus of this weekend is about mindfulness. Um, it's a term which has become popular in relation to a particular branch of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and we can touch a little bit on that. It's also a term that's used quite a lot in terms of Vipassana, particularly Goenka style. Uh, we can touch a little bit on that. But generally speaking, being mindful means not being mindless. That's all. Uh, the Tibetan word for it is drempa which is linked with memory. And memory can be memory of the past. It can also be memory of future intention. Like if you go to the shops, you can remember what you have to buy. So when you were in your kitchen and you looked at what was missing on the shelves, a thought is embedded which is remembered in the future. And of course, we can remember to be in the present. We can bring ourselves back to being in the present. Uh, that, that is to say, it's about attending to something, an intentional attention. And the more we do it with intention, gradually it becomes more normal and natural, and we're just careful. Careful, of course, has another sense of taking care of. Taking care of means being respectful to what's there. So. As we know, uh, <coughs> the word therapy also has its root in attention. It comes from the name that was given to the uh, supporters or helpers in the uh, healing centers of Asclepius in ancient Greece. And it means those who uh, accompany people on their journey into healing through dream. That's essentially where the, where the word comes from. So it means somebody who is thoughtful, careful, and attentive to something. In, in the case of therapy, to the state of the other. But we can also have a therapy for ourselves if we're attentive and careful of ourselves. If we're not thoughtful and careful, then we're at the mercy of whatever's happening. 
That is to say, with careful attention, you have the possibility of choice. Because care allows us to see that there are different options. In our lives, we probably all have been careless from time to time. And then, often, things don't go so well. And that's usually, when we're careless, we tend to abandon ourselves into something. We just kind of go for it or leap into it. It's often from a state of not really caring. Sometimes that can be done in a kind of hopeless way. Fuck it, I don't care. Just a sort of self-abandonment. Sometimes it's an intoxication through drugs, alcohol, through falling in love. It can be an intoxication through hatred. You, you might be a, have a boss you don't like and you, you just think, oh, fuck that. And you, you, you find yourself not attending <clears throat> to the lived situation. You cut yourself off from the context because you've gone into a, a, a sort of internalized frame of reference and how you're thinking and feeling becomes all that's important. And of course, when you act from that, you're likely to enter into conflict with the environment. The carelessness often leads to accidents in that way. So being careful and attentive is a movement which is not internal and not external, but is exactly on the cusp, the meeting place, where experience is arising in this ceaselessly changing point between our subjectivity and the field of experience. Being present in that, we, we are present with whatever is arising there. And some of these are factors from the past, in terms of memories, some are predictions, <clears throat> and some are things which are immediate through our senses. To be mindful we have to be able to discriminate between uh, what is, uh, in, a, in ordinary terms, let me put it this way, in ordinary terms, in order to be mindful, we have to discriminate between what is important and what is not important. That is to say, our intention, what I want to be on about, allows me to know when I'm straying from it and what I'm straying into, I now call a distraction. So we began with that brief meditation. We're going to focus on the breath, for example. Now I find myself wandering off. Because I have decided to focus on my breath, where I go when I wander off is now a distraction. If I hadn't decided to focus on my breath, quite pleasant to daydream and let your mind go all over the place. Why shouldn't you? Just, that's what's happening all the time. Stuff's happening. It, it is the intention which redefines the situation. And that's very important. Because it means that moment by moment we're living in a very complex field of experience. Internally we are complex. Externally there are so many factors going on. And as we develop at intentions moment by moment, we're taking a particular slice or cut, a sort of cross-section through the world, and saying, this is what I deem to be relevant, and therefore, the, the sort of natural corollary of that is, everything else is now irrelevant. Of course, that's half the sentence. It's irrelevant to me in this situation at this moment. It may well be relevant five minutes later when my focus of intention has shifted. From a Buddhist point of view, this is of course very helpful for thinking about impermanence. And we can see that in the course of the day, from waking up to going to sleep, our intention is, as it were, configuring the world around us in particular ways, moment by moment. So when you get up, it's quite important to clean your teeth. At the moment, we're probably not sitting here preoccupied with needing to clean our teeth. You might have an obsession with that. It's your private um, fantasy. You will leave that alone. But generally speaking, <laughs> clean your teeth in the morning and at night, and the rest of the time, you don't really want to worry about the toothbrush. So when you get up, the intention to clean your teeth gives an orientation. You've got to do that. So your body is mobilized towards doing that. And then 
various behaviors come. You decide, you know, with a modern um, tube of toothpaste, some people unscrew the top, some people just lift the flap and squeeze it through. If you squeeze it through, you get it all sticky and messy at the top, and people like me who unscrew it find that quite obscene and upsetting. <laughs> so someone else is... <laughs> In that, in that way, our own peccadillos, our own slices of the world, reveal particular context, don't they? That we are creating our world out of what we take to be important. And of course, we often normalize that by saying, well, that's how it is. That's how we do it. So education for children into culture is very much about that. So, as our intention is changing, our perception of the world changes. The world is revealed to us through the trajectory of our intention. And our intention is not stable or fixed, but is also contextual. So an, an arising factor acts to reveal aspects of other arising factors. Basic Buddhist proposition is there is no inherent selfness to who we are. We are not a fixed thing, but we are revealed as a moving dynamic display of arising moments, or we could call that energy. And as we <clears throat> turn ourselves through the course of the day from one situation to another to another, our internal experience and the external experience are both shifting. Mindfulness is about being present in that ever-changing flow of experience. Recognizing, of course, that different uh, behaviors belong to different settings. So, if you work in a hierarchical organization, you're likely to speak to your boss in a different way from the way you would speak to somebody who is structurally beneath you. If you're a teacher and you have a very mixed ability class, you, you speak to different students in different ways. You can see that some students will respond to something a bit sharp and pushing, and other students will just get upset with that. And they need something more um, supportive and gentle, because each person's growing edge or interface with their potential is different, and it will be different at different times of the year, different times of the day, and in different settings. So we could start to see that mindfulness is not a fixed state, but it's a capacity to be as closely aligned with this ever-changing movement of what's revealed in the juxtaposition of internal and external factors. That is to say, it's a way of staying very alive and very present respectful of oneself and respectful of others. If we tilt too much towards the other and sacrifice on ourselves, that's not helpful. And the other way, if we tilt too much towards ourselves and sacrifice others, that's not helpful. Because we share this world with others. We don't have a private world. So if the fantasy of interiority of me inside myself is an illusion. There's nothing inside us. It's not some little sort of secret box or some sort of the secret room in Bluebeard's castle that's somehow hidden in our left armpit. You know, what's inside and what's outside are the same. They're moving together all the time. What is private, as in our modern cult of self-display, people writing their autobiographies with every kind of nastiness that they've experienced, people clearly want to share what's inside. And the more we individualize as a culture and have a private life, we feel desperate to share it with other people. You know, Big Brother House, all of these things, people poking and sniffing around in other people's private lives. And from a Buddhist point of view, that's because we've got an intuition that it's wrong. Other people are not so different from us, and yet they are exquisitely different from us. So, what's that paradox? They're not different from us because the nature is the same. The basic building blocks out of which we are constructed are shared by all beings. But, as with turning a kaleidoscope, 
the patterning of these constituents creates infinite, infinite ranges of possibility. And so we are unique and specific in our manifestation. And of course, that's changing moment by moment. So the differences between us are not based on something hidden deep inside. They are manifest. They are displayed. We show our differences. <clears throat> and the thing about a, an approach of mindfulness would be to be interested in other people's difference, to how they manifest, how they show themselves. And therefore, how can I manifest and show myself in relation to them so that benefit for other and for self can occur? That's really at the heart of, of being mindful. That when we have a truly internal intention, personal intention, or in psychological language, a neurotic intention, because a neurosis is simply a set of mental factors which have been overprivileged and become cut off from the changing movement of the environment. When we are caught up in that, we don't see things as they are. Now, it may well be that we never really see things as they are, but we can minimize the amount of projection we make onto situations by rejigging the balance between perception and conception. That is to say, most of the time, we experience the world through our concepts. We've got ideas, assumptions, conditioning, habits, and these become the filters or the veils through which we approach the world. We, we're on about something. We've got numbers, we've got patterns, we've got procedures, we've got beliefs inside ourselves. And we come out towards the world in terms of a selective attention, looking for confirmation of our beliefs. The more we tilt towards perception, towards trying to see what is there, trying to be mindful of our interpretation as it arises, allowing it to be there, but also simultaneously mindful of the perceptual feel, what is revealed through our senses, and see that these two factors start to go into a dance. They start to mutually influence. Is that making sense? So what I believe about the situation, what, what I want, and what is there. Say you go shopping, and uh, I don't know, this, this is a long winter, so you and a wet, cold winter. So you might think, okay, I need to get a strong, windproof umbrella. You go into the shop, maybe it's a good, big, old-fashioned shop, you've got 10 kinds of umbrellas. You've then got what size? You have huge, big umbrellas, and if you're a small person, you hold them like you carry away. And it's also something to carry around all day long, and you might well forget it. So you could get a little folding one, but little folding ones in a strong wind tend to buckle up. So you've got your aesthetic interests. Could I really have a pink, pil uh, pink polka dot umbrella? Would that be uh, adequate to my status in the world? <laughs> so there's aesthetics, there's size, there's cost, there's function. All of these factors are coming as we look at what's there. How do we come to a decision? So we're used to doing this. Sometimes we buy something and then afterwards think, why did I buy that? What, what was happening in the mental configuration at the time? And we know, especially buying things in shops with uh, strip lighting, and you take them out in the daylight, they look rather different. Um, so, and we also know if you, if you go <laughs> shopping when you're hungry or shopping when your belly's full, you're likely to buy different kinds of food, and certainly different quantities of food. So in that way, on a very ordinary way, we can see that what we're on about, what we're up to, what we're into, which is, of course, a momentary context. But when we're in something, that affects our experience of the world. We look through these lenses, and what's revealed is something that will fit. Because the selective nature of our attention means we're looking for something which will dovetail with the assumption or the particular positioning that we have. So the practice of mindfulness <coughs> is to keep bringing to mind as many factors as possible 
so that we learn to live with complexity. It's not necessarily about simplicity. In certain kinds of, if you do this Vipassana sort of mindfulness, it's all about breaking everything down and making it very, very simple. I personally don't live in a simple world like that, and I don't want to live in a simple world like that. I don't want to shave my head. My hair's falling out by itself. I don't need to take a razor to do it. And I don't want to live in a monastery. And I don't want to look po-faced. When you look at these pictures of these Theravada monks, they don't look hellish happy. So, so it, you know, one has to think, how shall I live? If the world is so dangerous and the only way to be peaceful is to avoid it, that should give us some pause for thought. That is a reading or a method, and it's a method which can be useful, but it is a reading. It is a set of associations. It is a lens. Every lens will reveal something and conceal something. So every method is useful, but we have to be very clear what it's used for. There is a, a story in the Hindu tradition that uh, <clears throat> it's about Shiva and Parvati. And uh, when Shiva fell in love with Parvati and wanted to marry her, her dad said, uh-uh, no. Shiva, this man who you say you like, is very weird. He's not normal. We can't have you marrying somebody who's not normal. Look at him. He's covered in ashes. He's wearing an animal skin. He's stoned out of his head. He's got long hair. We don't want him. But she said, oh. And she ran away. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, they got together and had a little family. But due to the consequences of her action in disobeying her father and some other activities, one day she died. But when she died, Shiva became very, very upset. He took her in his arms and held her, and he refused to let her go. People are saying, oh, she's dead, she's dead. She was very fierce, big third eye in the middle of his forehead, yes. burning everyone up. Them. Okay, <laughs> get on with it. <laughs> they didn't have modern um, psychiatric services those days. <laughs> no one was going to section Shiva. <laughs> so there, there he is, he's dancing away, and gradually the corpse starts to ripen, and bits of Parvati start to loosen up, and as he dances, bits of her fly off. You know, her, her nose, her ears, her fingers, and they fall all over India. Eventually, there's nothing left of her. But across India, you can find little tantric pitas or sacred sites where parts of the goddess are found. And in the Egyptian tradition as well, they have stories of the dismembered gods and in many cultures. And very important that there's a relation between dismembering and remembering. What was once whole goes into parts. How can it become the same again? When the goddess comes into the world, she becomes useful for human beings. The parts have come out seemingly without purpose and yet become meaningful. When we're small, when we're born as babies, we have extreme porosity of our experience. That is to say, a huge amount comes in and a huge amount goes out. Babies are uniquely or particularly naked in that way. When they're upset, the tears and so on come out, body shaking and so on. And when they're absorbing, these huge big eyes open and they're just drinking the world in. In this absorption of the world, there's a kind of mimetic movement. They're copying and imitating what's around them. They're learning by internalizing, by interjecting. Parallel to this, but developing a little bit later, we start to project. And these are the two functions that go on throughout our life. In introjection, the other as to say, field factors, aspects of the world, come into us and become ourselves. And in projection, parts of ourselves go from the eyes out into the eye. We dismember ourselves 
and parts of us are located in other places. We know this. In our houses, I'm sure we all have objects of what might be called sentimental value. They don't mean anything to anyone else. Maybe just some postcards or something. You wouldn't throw them away because oh. oh. And it has that immediacy of it's meaningful. You know, if you have kids, your kids mean something to you. The other people who see them walking down the street says, that's another person. Oh, oh, girl. So that's a sentimental attachment. What that means is part of me is living in that person. I am not indifferent to them. And it's not just that we are connected, but actually we have located part of ourselves in them. If they die, it's, it's, it's as if part of us dies. And of course that's absolutely true. Because the bit of me that could have a particular conversation with my mother has to die because my mother is dead. I mean, of course, I can imagine my mum and so on, but it's not the same as seeing her face. It's the same with my dad. It's the same with people that I've known in the past. That is to say, as interactive beings, we come into existence as communication. That is what we are. We are communicative systems embedded in a meta, a general communicative system. There is nothing stable. This is the essence of the Buddha's teaching. Absence of inherent self-nature and impermanence. Communication's always moving. Communication doesn't sort of stay stable. It's dynamic and unfolding. It has no fixed essence to it, but is forming, deforming, reforming, dismembering, remembering. The third factor of the Buddha's basic teachings about, is about suffering, and suffering occurs due to attachment. That is to say, to want things to be fixed and stable especially to want oneself to be stable and reliable. But since our fate is connected with other people, how could it be? We have a skin bag around us, but this skin bag, if it were to be sealed up, if our ears were to be sealed, and our nostrils, and our mouth, and our eyes, and our genitals and anus, would that be a good experience? Would anybody like to enjoy total seal therapy? <laughs> you actually wouldn't live very long, would you? You would die. You would die probably in 10 minutes. There'd be no breath. Our bodies are full of holes because we are in ceaseless communication with the world. In our skin, we have many little pores. If you remember this mainstay of British culture, the James Bond movie, in Goldfinger, the lady is painted with gold paint. And of course, see, <coughs> that is a death sentence. Because when the skin can't breathe, gradually the body will collapse. This is absolutely what we are. This is not a theory or an idea. This is the phenomenology of our existence. We are nothing but communication. Breathing in, breathing out. The lungs expand and contract. The heart systolic, diastolic. Pumping, pulsating, rhythmic rhythms which are reverberating inside and outside all the time. This is what, we, this is what there is. So, <coughs> Dismembering <clears throat> is to cut bits of ourselves off and to forget them. When we become dismembered, we end up in a sealed body. Now, the big sealed body is the autonomous ego self. I am a monad. I exist just as myself. I don't require anything. I don't need anything. I am just me. This is a, a basic ego belief, which paradoxically is the basis of consumerist capitalism. Now, there must be something wrong if each self-defining individual is spending all their time out there grabbling to get money and buy stuff. Because why do you want to buy so much stuff if you're already internally defined? 
What's the nature of the need or the lack? The lack is not negative. The lack is participative. It is our lack that brings us together. We need each other. That's not a shameful secret. That's not low self-esteem. That's not some terrible, hellish, internal vulnerability. It's part of life. Remember Barbara Streisand, people who need people? The luckiest people in the world? There's some truth in that, because actually all the people need people. Why do we need people? Because our identity is interpersonal. We don't live inside ourselves. We live in our participation in the world. So <coughs> when we deny the fact <coughs> that we are created out of our interactions with the world, that what we take to be I, me, myself is created out of our interactions with our parents, our school teachers, books that we've read, TV programs we've seen, music that we've heard, drugs that we've taken, all sorts of stuff that we've had, all of that has shifted and moved and nourished and created a repertoire of responses and movements. This range is activated by changes in the field around us. It's not that I continuously decide what I'm going to do, but I am called forth into my being by particular situations. Would that be right? People tell us that you know they've been to the hospital and then they, they've got a diagnosis that they've got cancer. That calls us into being in a particular way. Someone says, my child's just left and they've gone to a country far away. That calls us into our being in a particular way. Somebody says, I've just got a new job and I'm really excited. We respond in a different way. That's what we do. It's not that we decide to respond, but if what they're saying comes into us, if we let it in, if we are touched and moved, we're moved into that response. We don't actually have to think about it or plan it. It just flows through us. And this is enormously important. This is the meaning of the Buddhist teaching of an absence of inherent self-nature. This is not something esoteric or abstract or weird. It's just the fact that if you smile at me, I'll smile back. And I'll have smiled before I know why I'm smiling. There is a pulsation or a flow the more self-concerned I become, the more anxious I become, I'm going to interrupt that flow of communication. Isn't that right? I see quite a lot of people in my practice who have various forms of social anxiety. Social anxiety means when they go into a social situation, they imagine that other people are primarily concerned with, with them. The patient feels Everybody's looking at me, and I don't know what to say. So, I wouldn't know what to say if everybody was looking at me in that <laughs> You wouldn't. <laughs> so, being put on the spot will constellate us in a particular way. The actual fact is, you're not being put on the spot. Everybody's just bopping around their own little world. They don't really care, and they don't really see you. From birth to death, the likelihood of really being seen by another human being is pretty damn rare. You know, if you get it 5% of your life, you're doing okay. Most of the time, we're like ships that pass in the night. People are in their little worlds. That's sad, but I think it's probably true. So the social anxiety, everybody can see me, they've got x-ray eyes, they know what I'm thinking, is actually the projection of a self-preoccupation. It's grounded in the belief there's something wrong with me, my faults and demerits determine and define who I am, 
other people can see this and therefore they will draw the same negative conclusion about me as I do. <coughs> and that kind of structure develops due to an attack on the porosity of the early infant. Children need to be protected, not necessarily in the way that modern society protects them. Primarily they need to be protected from the unskillful gaze of other people. The unskillful gaze is of two main kinds, too much and too little. The very critical person who believes they really understand what's going on for the baby. With the baby, we don't really know. We have to attend. We, we can attend with care and love and concern and hope that the baby will manage to reveal what's happening for it. But if the mother always knows too quickly what's wrong with the baby, they're intervening in a way that will be slightly off, but the baby will learn to adapt. And similarly, if the parental field doesn't have adequate concern, the baby will never be met. The baby needs to be met on its skin. If the gaze is going through the skin, it's not going to thrive. And if the gaze doesn't re reach the skin, it's not going to thrive either. And that's, of course, true for all of us through the course of our lives. But as we get bigger, it becomes more difficult and more complicated because we don't actually live in our skin. You know, most of us have either collapsed inside somewhere or we're bopping out there. You know, we've, we've put on some kind of persona and we're, you know, Mr. Bonhomme and filling the, filling the world with stuff. And that latter movement is a, is a ruse. It's a, it's a sort of red herring, isn't it? It distracts people. The show must go on and you'll never know who I am. That's a protective defense. And trying to hide inside yourself right to the extreme, the extreme of dissociation is another way of hiding. And with both of these, you're not actually in your skin. And if you're not in your skin, you're not in your senses. And if you're not in your senses, you're not going to really get an accurate reading of the world as it is. And so, necessarily, you're then going to be relying on the mental map that you've already developed. So, if you can't inhabit your skin because of the persecutory or depleting environment of childhood, it's likely that the map you have of the world is going to be a bit off as well. So you're not with things as they are, and you're trying to construe them out of a frame of reference which is off kilter. So we bang into things. So mindfulness is an attempt a way of thinking about how one could do that differently. Of again and again bringing ourselves back to what's happening in this moment. And in particular, how am I in this moment? What are the arising factors of experience, external and internal? What sort of thoughts, feelings and sensations are arising? What sort of colors and shapes and sounds, tastes and smells are coming from the environment? And attending to them in a way that will allow them to reveal what they are. That is to say, as part of meditation, mindfulness is concerned with waiting. Although it's a fairly, if we take it into its vipassana mode, and I'll explain these things, sort of technical terms a bit later, we take it into that mode. Uh, it is quite an active, um, intentional activity. But nonetheless, there's something about waiting, letting things happen, and seeing what they are. I was listening to something on the radio, and there was an interview with two women who had been tracking um, a Norse woman who had made some uh, travels and journeys and written about them many hundred years ago up in Greenland and further north. And uh, one of the women had followed her journey and was talking about her experiences with the Inuit people, Eskimo kind of people. She was saying that this uh, Inuit say, Western people, white-skinned people are very strange because 
if they're out and a big storm starts, they start running around. And when they run around, they become very hot. And when they're hot, they sweat. And then it starts to get very cold. And the sweat freezes on their body. And then they die. As soon as we see the storm coming, we sit down. We get all our position together. We put the skins under us. We wrap the skins around us. And, sit. and then the storm comes and the snow comes. And we just sit there and talk a little bit. We wait. Maybe the storm's there for two days. And then it goes by. And then we get up and shake the snow off and get on with our lives. That's very interesting. You know, that's a real instruction in meditation. Usually when stuff is arising in our mind, we get agitated. We think, oh God, what will I do? This is terrible. I've got to sort it out. And that very busyness itself builds up a sweat. And we're off balance. And we're not thinking the situation may well be much, much bigger than us. If it's a blizzard, running around in a circle is not going to change it. Lots and lots of mental activity is not going to change many of the problems in our lives. Just sit comfortable and watch. Waiting and watching. Calm and clear. And then it reveals itself. Then we see this is how it is. And if we see how it is, moment by moment as it's manifesting, there's a possibility of locating oneself, of placing oneself, so that if one is going to make a move, it's the most finely attuned, the most nuanced move, so that a little effort will get optimal gain, rather than just kind of headless chicken stuff, which is, of course, very often what we're used to. We can see with the current economic crisis, this is total headless chicken territory. And as Britain moves into its defense review, will be again headless chicken territory. And whatever party gets into power and they make all their cuts in public services, it will again be headless chicken territory. Because it's very, very difficult to think. If you think, if you see how things are, you'd weep. And if you're a politician that weeps, you won't get elected. So you've got to smile because they're selling hope and selling dreams. And we buy these dreams and we follow Gordon Lemming over the cliff. <laughs> we know this. People have done it for a very long time. Go back to Cromwell and all the rest of it. History in any country is made of the same things. Ideal fantasies, whether it's religious sects like Jonestown and so on, or political groups, uh, economic groups, the fantasy that somehow a big plan can solve everything is so intoxicating for us because it speaks to our laziness. Someone else somewhere will do it. Therefore, I can just switch off my brain. Because if I stay connected with it and I see how complicated it is, I'll get very frightened and I won't know what to do. And as the anxiety arises at that point, we just want to get out of it. And the whole function of meditation is to learn how to relax more and more so that complexity can become enjoyable rather than anxiety provoking. Complexity will not end. This world, I mean, there are clearly lots and lots and lots of things going on that are pretty weird for the future. Probably not going to get simple. How will we deal with that? What will we do? What will we do? Have a cup of tea. <laughs> cup of tea is one of the best English contributions to the world culture. <laughs> If you're having a cup of tea, this opens up the whole area of skill in mindfulness. For beginners, the best biscuit for dunking is the ginger nut. <laughs> the ginger nut is a very cohesive kind of biscuit. It can stand probably 30 seconds of dunking. Now, the digestive biscuit is much more difficult. The digestive biscuit will dissolve very quickly. Huh? These are important. <laughs> this is being attentive to, to details 
there are many different kinds of potatoes. Some potatoes will take a lot of boiling and keep their shape. Others, if you boil them for that same period of time, you just get potato soup. Same with tomatoes. All the different vegetables and many different kinds. People are very different kinds. The world is complicated. So we can take one day, oh, there's too much to learn, I can't cope. I can't cope is enormously important for all of us because it's the moment where we see the limitation of ourselves. I can't cope means I need resourcing. That's all. Especially if people have had so-called trauma experiences in the past and they've experienced being overwhelmed in various ways so that the psychosomatic system has been severely challenged and they build up uh, uh, habits of fight, flight, um, freezing and flopping, these kind of classic reactions to something which is beyond our capacity. What's required is more nurturing so that at the point of depletion where we feel I can't cope, we have things to hand which we can bring in, relax, expand, and experience again, I am bigger than the problem. If the problem is bigger than me, I will not be able to solve it. This is not good. I have to increase in size. How will I do that? By doing less. This is again one of these strange paradoxes. And, you know, people have recorded this in all sorts of different ways. You have a problem, you can't solve it, you want to bang your head on the wall, you go to sleep, next morning you wake up, you see something different. It's stepping back from locking in. Because the lock-in that we have is always the view from here. That moment by moment we are situated in a particular constellation of our capacity. Does that seem right? And if, you, if you've got some troubling situation, maybe in a relationship or in a conflict of work, and you don't know what to do, if you remain in the same position inside yourself, the more you think about it, you just vibrate faster. You just get, get stirred up, your breathing is going to change, your muscular tension will increase, and so on. Best thing to do is go for a walk. Interrupt the positioning that you've taken on, and in the new configuration that can arise, you will have a new point of reference, and from that you'll have a new view. Something will be revealed, and then there's usually something that can be done. Again, this is the heart of the Buddha's basic teaching. Because there is no inherent self-nature, whenever we over concretize a definition, I can't do it, I can't do it, this is, I, I just don't know. If, we, if we're mindful, we can catch that. Oh, I am aligning myself or fusing with a very restricted definition. That's what's happening. Once you fuse with it, it is as if it is the whole story. No? If you defuse from it, it's just a particular opinion or point of view. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hopefully you can see that in, in, in your own life situations. That all of us, I'm sure, get caught or trapped in things and we feel it's awful. And then something happens, maybe you chat to a friend. Chatting to a friend is not, it's not really the rational aspect of the conversation that's important, but the fact that they don't think that we are nuts somehow reconfigures us so that well, we can approach it with more energy and with a different tilt. So the whole idea of mindfulness, especially mindfulness of impermanence, is to recognize there will be no stable place. And as with everything in life, it swings and roundabouts. The disadvantage of there being nothing stable is that we've got to keep moving. The advantage of the fact that we have to keep moving is we'll never get caught. <laughs> swings and roundabouts. You pay your money and you take your choice. 
But if you want it to be stable and not get caught, it's not going to be that way. So this is a dynamic, ever-changing set of circumstances that we find ourselves in. But we don't actually live on that level. We live in the world of <coughs> abstraction, of narrative, of stories. So we tend to try to reassure ourselves by telling stories to ourselves about who we are. And if these stories are narrow and tightly construed, in a sense they're reassuring because we're saying the same thing again and again. And that reiteration somehow concretizes something. But it's also too tight. It's over-definitive. We're forgetting most of our potential. So how can we reassure ourselves, that is to say, how can we stay open and connected? How can we believe that it will be okay to not know and be connected? Well, that's a function of meditation, essentially. To try to move from the narrative structure, which is the domain of our ego, our constant storytelling, telling people things about ourselves, believing the things that other people tell us about ourselves, positioning ourselves in that rather overdefined way, to something which is more immediate, more direct. The experience of breathing in and out, being here, and working with circumstances. Who is the one who works with circumstances? That will be the one who arises with the circumstances. So, if you don't exist as a thing, if you cannot be defined, you will find yourself arising into the circumstantial situation, into the contingency, the meeting together, the juxtaposition of the arising elements. That is the point to be mindful. It's like you're going to a party or you're going to an event. What shall I wear? It's going to be very important. What kind of shoes? How will I do my hair? Is lipstick appropriate or not? <laughs> These are questions that trouble some of us. <laughs> my secret life is out. <laughs> <laughs> Because in different circumstances, you have to show yourself. So what is the best interface? Now, can I be appropriate to the circumstance? Can I do what is required? Generally, this question rests in the house or the point where wisdom and compassion meet. Because if we have wisdom, we know that we are not a fixed thing. And if we have compassion, we make a gesture towards a situation. I remember when I was 16, then <coughs> walking down the Pennine Way and stuff, and I met my parents in the south of England. And we met my brother, who was in the army at the time. And we went for a holiday in Brighton. And my parents wanted us to go to some concert or something on the pier. And me being an extremely unpleasant 16-year-old, I refused. And they went with my brother. And after my, afterwards, my dad was saying, it's in moments like this that you can destroy a family. <laughs> and it was completely true. And I didn't, I didn't get it. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. And, but years later, I suddenly see, wow, these things are really important that my anxiety as a 16-year-old about who I was and not wanting to be with my parents, living in this kind of bubble of my self-concern, my self-definition, completely lacked any compassion in thinking about that. And of course, my brother went off and did something, and my father died not all that long after, and it was one of the last moments. And, you know, looking back, I think, oh, God, if only I'd known that. Of course, well, you don't know. But in these moments, we can see in our own lives how our self-regard, our self-concern just attacks 
the meaning of our existence, which is communication. That's why they have so many texts in Mahayana Buddhism stressing um, love and compassion and care and concern. May all sentient beings be happy. And the idea in the Bodhisattva vow, I will become a servant for all beings. I will put others first. I will think about what they need. Because if we can't sacrifice on ourselves, we'll be no use to anyone else. Of course, if the sacrifice is too deep on ourselves, or we're using a very uh, blunt knife to make the cut, if it's out of placation, if it's out of a uh, feeling of unentitlement in ourselves, it's not, a, it's not a meaningful sacrifice at all. It's not a real gift. It's, it's our neurosis that's creating a kind of pseudo-gesture. So it's, you know, it's very helpful, I think, for us to remember times in our lives where we have become so small that we rejected other people. And in that rejection, there's a kind of desolation. We win, but we lose. That the moments when people could have been together and the transaction of belonging, of connectivity, is thrown into the wind and all we have is this, I did it my way, which is very thin soup. Not really something we can survive with. So, generally speaking, mindfulness means recollection, to recollect ourselves. That is to stay, to, to have access to as rich a display of all one's potential qualities and to recollect the field in which we're operating, that is to say, to take our projections off it as much as possible, and keep the projection hovering in the air, because that's part of our experience, but it's not part of what's actually there, and try to see precisely how other people are, how should we be with them, and then to bring into relation with that the possibility of movement. And again, one of the paradoxes, I think, here is the more attentive we are to being present with these manifesting factors, which in a sense is slightly intentional, the more spontaneous our behavior will be. Because the, the, the movement of our behavior arises in that interface of subject and object, self and other, a, a site where there is no real boundary, because our basic conditions, one of non-duality. So the more precise and attentive we are to all the factors, they will arise. They will arise into that situation. Okay, shall we take a short break there? We'll come back and move more precisely into the four factors of mindfulness. So if we have a break, say, for 20 minutes. Okay. Mindless. <laughs> That's why you need to have someone to remind you. Which is actually an interesting thing, because you, you get all these stories about, you know, like kings and very powerful people never carry any money, because they always have minders to carry the, the money for them. Um, so one person who's in a powerful position, if they're on top of the pyramid, they can be kind of free and spontaneous, and there are other people picking up the pieces and managing everything. And maybe we have to somehow integrate these two functions. Because if we're, if we're anxiously mindful, we're not going to have the spontaneity. Um, so that's a, an interesting thing to hold in mind. How, how to be one's own minder. Um, and that the minding function shouldn't interrupt the uh, spontaneity of, of our heart movement out into the world. But it, it's there as a supportive uh, aspect. So, 
from the uh, Satipatthana Sutra, saying, which is simply the, 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 the sutra on the, the uh, pointing out the, the nature of sati, which is uh, mindfulness. It focuses on four aspects. Um, the body, uh, what might be called feeling or sensation, uh, the mind or consciousness, and uh, dharmas or phenomena. And the first of these is the body. <laughs> so clearly we all have a body. Being mindful of the body on, in its most general level means to hold our embodiment as part of our ongoing experience. That is to say, not to get lost in your head. You know, if, because you, you are in a body, if the sense of the body, the movement of the limbs, the pulsation of the breath, the, the experience of uh, the impact of objects on the senses, if this is alive and present for us, there's a particular quality to being alive in that. Uh, you may have some particular memory, say, from your childhood of riding a bicycle or climbing a tree or running on the beach or running on the hills. And there's that whole sense of just being fully present in the body, as the body. And, and that's not something that we need to lose. <coughs> so in terms of the dismembering, we can separate the mind and the body. This is not something that started with René Descartes. This is something that's very pervasive in, for all of us. That when we go into an attention to mental factors, we can forget our embodiment. And the body is the link into the world. The body is part of the world. The mind can appear to be somehow something other than that, to have a, an existence of its own. The, big, the first part of mindfulness of the body is on the breath. And the breath, again, is very important because the breath is our connection with the world. When we breathe, you know, you can say, well, I breathe in, then I breathe out. That formulation is very interesting because it's talking about subjective experience and a kind of agency. I breathe in, I breathe out. I lift my hand, I lower my hand. But unless we're rather sick, we're not in any way having to intentionally breathe. We just keep breathing. We even breathe when we're asleep. If we didn't breathe when we were asleep, we would be dead. So it's quite a good idea to breathe. So who is breathing when we breathe? If you're asleep, how can you say, I breathe? Somebody's breathing. So when, when we talk about uh, I breathe in and out, it's too subjective in its focus. Breath is moving in and out. What is the breath? It's the air. The air is the atmosphere of this planet that we live on. The planet comes into me, I go into the planet. When the air comes in, it brings all its blessed constituents, bits of car fumes, bits of other people's skin and so on, little molecules come into our lungs, and then we kindly return the favor. Bits of us get sent out on our breath. Little bits of us pervading the world. So the breath is inside and outside. We, the breath is a hole in the front of our face and these two little nostrils the world is in us. It's the movement of the world in and out of us. Because if your lungs really collapsed, if you didn't have any air in them, that'd be pretty bad news. You really don't want to die of consumption. So there's always air in the lungs. That air is the world. The world is inside us. So mindfulness on the breath is the real sense of not only embodiment, but enworldedness. We are not apart from the world. That is so important because it means that you have choices 
within the situation, you don't have choices outside. That incident that I was describing of me as a teenager, I was acting as if I wasn't in the family. While, of course, staying with my parents in a hotel that my father was paying for. I certainly wasn't <laughs> paying for it. <laughs> Eating the food that my father was buying and wearing the clothes that my father had bought for me. But I wasn't in the family. In the same way, you know, mentally you can think, I'm not part of the world. It's nothing to do with me. I didn't ask to be born. But of course, this is a madness. Because we, we, are, we, are, we are born into the world as part of the world. So the relation of mind and body is central here. And being mindfulness, mindfulness then is to be alive and present at the place where what we call subject and what we call object seem to meet. But they don't just meet by chance, they are always meeting. This is why uh, in some of the uh, paintings here, not very many, but this one over here of um, Purpa, you see the, that the god and the goddess are depicted in sexual union. This sexual union of the, of the deities is the union of subject and object, of self and other. It's a symbol of non-duality. That we are always in intercourse with the world. We don't move into the world. We're already, we're permanently, if you like, having sex with the world. Breathing in and out, you could see as this kind of sexual thing. You get penetrated by the air coming in. Then you penetrate the world. Your breath goes out into it. And this interpenetration is going on all the time. Clearly, with our modern scientific understanding, we say light comes from objects in through our eyes. But we still feel, I'm looking at the world. So the, the, the light of the world comes into us, but we are looking out. And, and that's, again, a kind of interpenetration. Things come into us that we don't ask to come in, like noises and so forth. But we also go out, putting our hearing into situations. That's it's a very dynamic sense of being, isn't it? And it's not lonely. It's, I belong. This is my whole field. Therefore, <clears throat> in being connected through the body as part of the world, I'm connected to all other beings, which is central in terms of the notion of compassion. I, I'm not stepping across to somebody who's other. In the, <clears throat> the interesting story in the Bible of the Good Samaritan, the person who, seeing somebody in trouble, somebody from another group, somebody whose group is, uh, as it were, a structural enemy of mine, makes a decision to cross the road and take care of that person. He's saying, you are not other to me. I could have you as other. I can stay in my def definition, and then you have nothing to do with me. But by, by connecting with the hurt condition of this person, somebody who's sick on a road, somebody who's alone, one's taken out of oneself. This again is a function of mindfulness, not to, to rest in a mental world, but to come back to the basic coexistence that we share with all beings. So in practicing mindfulness of the breath, <clears throat> first thing to, to note here is that it's slightly different from the shamatha practice we did at the beginning. We call it shamatha, it means calming. When we focus our attention on the breath, going in and out of the nostrils, we're wanting to keep the breath fairly regular and stable because it is our focus of attention. If it's wandering around too much, <clears throat> it's an unstable anchor. And our minds anyway are going to be wandering. So if the breath can be as stable as possible, it gives you a more reliable reference point to bring your attention back to. That's <clears throat> that kind of meditation. In mindfulness of the breath, we are observing how the breath is, that it shifts and changes. 
And you can do this sitting down. You can do a bit of it together just now. But you can also do it when you get up in the break or go off at lunchtime. And in particular, to observe what happens to your breath in different situations. Something nice is happening, or you're going to cross the roads and the lights are just changing, so you kind of speed up to get across, and your breath's changed. Or you try to work out what you want to eat, you get a bit puzzled, that's going to affect your breath as well. So, the events of the world influence your breath. That's really something to check out. And here at this point, I don't want to make this too complicated, but at this point there are, there are two sort of principal directions in Buddhism which one can follow. One is the path of development, of thinking, <clears throat> here I am, an ordinary person, I've got lots of limitations, I could do better, I've got progress I can make. Therefore, I'm going to consciously try to improve what I do. And this involves effort. There's a lot of effort that can be made. The second uh, approach is to stay with the approach of liberation. Phenomena arise and pass. The Buddha's basic teaching is suffering arises from attachment. When I attach myself into this situation, when I weave myself into this situation, that's where all the trouble begins. The main thing is to relax, release, and drop it. Just accept this is what's happening. That is to say, to move from being conditioned to being unconditioned. So say, for example, when you're observing your breath, you find a whole stream of angry thoughts are agitating your breath. You might decide, I want to keep my breath, my breath calm and clear. Therefore, these angry thoughts are an interruption to me. They are attacking me, they are undermining the calmness of my breath. And also, I want to be a good person. I don't want to be full of anger. I need to work on my anger so that it no longer troubles me. That's a particular reading. Another view is angry. Here I go. Been here before. Nothing new. Sometimes I'm angry. And in the moment of the recognition of it and the owning of it, there's also a disowning of it. If I can say, yeah, I am angry and no big deal, then the anger is allowed to, to be what it is because you acknowledge it, you welcome it. Yeah, it's a fact, I'm pissed off. And because I know I'm pissed off, it's now already going because I'm not standing in relation to it as something troubling me. It's just something that happens. And we can do the same with envy, with jealousy, with anxiety, with humiliation, with low self-esteem. All the arising factors which can appear to determine who we are, we can respond to by trying to change and transform them, or we can just accept, this is how I am. So in terms of mindfulness of the breath, one's just observing how one's breath is. Due to causes and circumstances, my breath is now quick. My breath is now slow. My breath is now changing and agitated. My breath is now so subtle, it's just on the edge of my capacity to be consciously aware of it. These movements all arise due to causes and conditions. If I don't make it a hierarchical, a vertical axis and say, the best kind of breath is dot, 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 whatever kind you want, long, slow, deep breath, for example. Lots of people get into that if they do yoga. Breath should be very deep, the diaphragm should be relaxed. Well, it's quite good for some things. It's not very good for other things. So, but if you put it on this vertical axis and you say, no, this is the kind of breath that I have, 
Then you have to say, and any activity which alters this or undermines it is prescribed. So in religious traditions, you get all sorts of things. You shouldn't eat garlic, you shouldn't eat ginger, because these are foods which heat the body up and agitate the energy system and will disturb the breath and the flow of thought. Yeah, come on. <laughs> there is so little that we can control in life. You know, you can't control what the neighbors do. You can't control someone starting their car, revving and revving on a cold morning, waking you up. You know, there's very little that we can control. So getting, you know, finicky about your diet, you know, ooh, I couldn't eat garlic. <laughs> it's bad for me chakras. <laughs> this is a little bit daft. The, the, the key point is just to see, ah, I, till now, am alive, and because I'm alive, I'm affected by what's going on. That's what's happening. So either I can relax and try to be present with how I am in relation to the other, which is still workable. It's not that you're pinned to the wall and it's a done deal. There is, there's still possibility of movement, but movement inside what's actually occurring. Or I can bring forward my template and think, it shouldn't be like this. This is wrong. I have to change it. If you take that latter pathway, you'll always be busy. Because you'll be attempting to control something which you can't control. And these methods have generally been developed in monasteries, or particularly in the forest tradition, where monks would go and live in, in solitary conditions, in very peaceful conditions, where there was very little that untoward that would be impinging on their existence. We don't live in that at all. So if you focus on an orientation of control, you're likely to increase your anxiety and your sense of failure. Whereas, if we can just accept, in being part of the world, events will turn me around. That's how it is. That's not a mistake. It doesn't mean that I'm weak-willed or that I'm vulnerable. Vulnerable in the sense of, of some kind of inadequacy and I should be stronger. But my very being, because it is communicative, is bound to be responsive to what is occurring. And this is how it is responding. That is to say, that's a neutral description. My breath is hot and agitated. No, that's what it is. It won't be like that forever. Due to causes and circumstances, eventually it will change and something else will be the case. So, when we're practicing mindfulness of the breath, essentially all we're doing is bringing our attention into the body to observe as closely as possible what is occurring. It's just about what. What is there? Now, in order to do the what, we have to probably at first struggle to separate, as I was indicating earlier, perception from conception because we carry within us many, many assumptions about how things should be, many expectations and many hopes. In some circumstances, these are quite useful factors to have because they can drive you forward and energize you. But if you're trying to observe what is there, a predilection, uh, uh, something uh, determined prior to the situation is not going to be helpful because you now have a particular template of evaluation that's saying this is the wrong way or not how it should be. So allowing your life to be as messy as it is, is very, very important. One of the things that can be quite alarming in any kind of meditation is that when you relax the ego's defensive agency, the storytelling that we keep running to give us a, a good reading about who we are. When you relax that, you encounter something pretty weird. The weirdness of yourself. That we are all rather strange. 
we have funny kind of thoughts arise. The body gets full of strange sensations, we've got sudden impulses. We're a pretty movable feast, there's all kind of stuff going on. That's what it is. That's how it is. It's not a mistake. So it's very, very important in, in this practice to become curious about conditioning. What have I learned through my family, through my school, through the more general culture? What have I learned about how I should be? What expectations do I import into situations which cause me to be confused? Now, if we think that, you know, if you think of small babies, they do seem to have a basic integrity to them. And then you meet the, the same small person again when they're five or six, and they're somehow both bigger and more's going on, but also somehow diminished as well, because they're becoming particular. They're developing an individuality. So we could say that to a certain extent they've been dismembered. Aspects of their potential which might have ripened if they were in a different family or with different circumstances have become a bit constrained and stunted. And other aspects have become perhaps a bit overdeveloped. So I think we get the contortion of our family system as we grow up. So when we start to try to see how things are, we're encountering a lot of bias inside ourselves that certain experiences are forbidden, or I shouldn't be like that. That is to say, my developed cultural interpretation becomes a barrier to me seeing what is there. That is to say, I don't I find it difficult to accept that I am a construct and that the criteria of being a construct gets in the way of me seeing what's actually there. The experiment of <coughs> Dr. Frankenstein was not uh, just a one-off. All of us, in some way, are Frankenstein's children. Because of what did Frankenstein do? He got bits of different bodies, and he chopped them up. He dismembered them, and then he remembered them, a bit from here and a bit from there, stitched them all together, and then waited for the great electric storm, and suddenly the monster was there. That monster was an artificial construct. The monster, of course, is desperate to be natural. The monster seeks to belong, but somehow can't belong. The monster looks in the window at the family as they sit and play music together and says, I want to be part of that. Why can't I be part of that? But when they see his face, they, they're in horror. This may be an experience that some of us have and maybe feel almost on a daily basis, that there is something alien about us, untoward. We, we can't quite fit in. We see other people having <clears throat> ordinary lives, normal lives, but we can't quite find the front door to get in. We're just peering in the window. And, and part of that is the imprisonment in attitudes, attitudes of our culture, particularly in England, our class, the kind of education we have, the kind of politics we follow, and so on, that we have cobbled ourselves together, that we are, we are both the monster and Dr. Frankenstein, because we've done a DIY self. All children have to do that. They, they construct themselves. When the child is small and goes into the school playground, the parent is left behind. The child doesn't know what to do in the playground, but they find their way, and they work out how to survive what people to talk to, what games to play and what not. And if you choose to play football, then you're not playing with cars. If you're doing the skipping game, then you're not talking about your dolls. You have to make choices. And every time you make a choice, you both privilege a particular situation and you abandon another part of yourself. So in that way, we, we've got...
bits us out. We're chopping bits of ourselves off, popping them in our pockets, saying, well, don't worry, sweetie, I'll bring you out later. But then we forget these bits of ourselves and we over-accentuate others. So when we come to do meditation, we have these particular profiles, which we are used to thinking, this is me, this is how I am. And in trying to see what is actually there, we have to gradually relax this template of expectations and try to just be with how things are. That our fantasies, our predictions, the foreclosures of our assumptions, none of these are giving us an accurate account of what is actually occurring in the moment. In order to see what's in the moment, we have to, as much as possible, adopt the phenomenological method. That is to say, to bracket off assumptions, to become conscious of what we are importing or projecting. Not to see it as negative, but just to see it doesn't apply there. I don't need to see the world through this lens. That is a lens I can use, I have used, I'll probably use again. But in this particular circumstance, I'm just going to look. I'm just going to look. Just looking involves not knowing. Because as soon as you know, you'll know what you're looking for. And if you know what you're looking for, that's what you will be looking for. And then you've got the selective attention. Of course, for many of us, um, developing our lives, which could mean uh, freeing ourselves from our family background, or trying to work out who we were. The, the development of ourselves has been linked to education, to reading and studying and getting ideas. That is to say, knowledge has been a path of freedom in some way. It's opened up doors in our lives. This kind of practice involves not knowing. So if your emotions are saying, uh -uh, I, <laughs> why, why would I want to not know? It's knowing that keeps me safe. That then can become an obstacle to the inquiry. So in a sense, it is a bit like the um, scientific method as it's developed over the last 300 years. We work with a hypothesis. We, it's not a dogmatic thing. We're not trying to... Um, we're, we're simply trying to investigate. We're not trying to install a particular kind of truth. But there is often resistance to that. Many, many people want to do meditation, decide they're going to do meditation, and then don't do meditation. Most people do much less meditation than they would hope to do. Because meditation is taking a holiday from the ordinary frame of reference, which is the place where I know who I am and I know how to run my life. When we go into meditation, we don't know who we are. And we don't know how it works. We're just looking. We go, as it were, with an empty bowl. Now, if you've got an empty bowl, you can fill it up. If you go with a bowl full of your assumptions and knowledges, there's not much space to put new, new understanding in. So the emptying out of curiosity is very lovely, but it's likely to bring some kind of resistance. So, in terms of mindfulness of the breath, you can just sit for a while. Um, just sit in a relaxed way. That is to say, the body should be relaxed so that it's not holding muscular tension. The spine should do the work. And we're going to simply be mindful of the movement of the breath. That is to say, we're not thinking about the breath, we're not entering into our feelings about our breath. We're just trying to observe, how is my breath? Now, thoughts may arise, and these thoughts may impact your breath. So at that moment, don't focus on the thought, simply focus on the shift in the breath. Or say a car goes down the street. Observe, does that shift your breath at all? And observe, sometimes the breath is long, Sometimes it's short. Sometimes it has a kind of aroused intensity. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's very, very subtle. In all these situations, just 
focus your attention on it. So it's it's an it, it requires a kind of effortful engagement, but pitched at a level that's not going to agitate you. But it is we're doing we're going to do work, which is the work of looking, staying present with the breath, however it is, and not attending to the other factors in the field. Maybe take a few minutes and share with the neighbor your experience of that. First of all, is it easy to do? And secondly, what sort of things do you notice? Okay. Um, See if there are any uh, thoughts or reflections you'd like to make from that. Uh, I was just talking to a partner here earlier about, um, because I actually teach yoga, and there's a, a lot in that about deliberate manipulation of the breath. And so on the one hand, you know, that, that seems the need that needs to be fulfilled. You know, there are techniques to be learned or whatever. And yet on the other hand, this spontaneity of just allowing the breath just to be as it is and observe and not judge <coughs> or whatever, almost like completely opposite end of the spectrum. And for me, it's been a challenge actually allowing both of those to be, not going, to, not going entirely with one and mm -hmm. saying, any sort of manipulation of the breath must be wrong. Um, but on the other hand, allowing the space for that, to watch the breath arise spontaneously as well. So it's been a bit of a struggle to get that balance between the two. Mm. There used to be an advert on television that said, a Mars a day helps you work, rest, and play. <laughs> so in yoga, it's working with the breath. It's saying that there are particular tensions in the pranic system, in the, in the nadis and so on, which need to be loosened up. And therefore, breath control, various kumbhakas and so on from the pranayam, are very helpful for readjusting imbalances. So it's a bit like being a carpenter with a toolkit. You know, you've got chisels and you've got hammers and so on. And each of these tools will be useful for certain tasks. If you use the wrong tool, for a task is not helpful. And when people grow up in, through families and schools, we often, uh, as I'm suggesting, we do sort of DIY. We get all these tools, we don't really know what they're for, and we whack them in the wrong way. So our, bre our breathing gets out of balance, and our posture's out of balance. So yoga's a great place for inspecting the toolkit and learning to apply particular kinds of breath to unlock particular kinds of problems. But it is work. And then at the end of the yoga session, you have relaxation. You rest. The question then is, well, where's the place of play? And uh, particularly, say, in Sokshen, it's a lot about play. Because everything is illusory, and therefore the discriminations that we make are purely conventional. So although on the level of conventional interpretation, things are wrong and we need to sort them, on the level of illusion and play, nothing is wrong. It's just as it is. And, and finding the way through that is, uh, is difficult. So Padmasambhava is the great Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts or reflections? Mm -hmm. so the adhesiveness that <clears throat> often my mind will bounce between me as the subject doing it, object as the breath, and it will follow it 
come up with a storyline when I'm going front to my tension, when I'm going front to get a preempt, what's happening, and different sensations. So, like, my tension will bounce around multiple inches on the bar. And <coughs> I know that's a bit different to an actual way I lean, which is more about, I seem much more comfortable with sort of resting lightly in it, and more like riding on like a horse, the tension will just mm -hmm. go everywhere. Knowingness of just resting on the horse and let it go, mm -hmm. go like a non distraction mm -hmm. sense of it now. So, um, yeah, am I deluding myself in that? Or is it can I lean towards where I naturally? Mm -hmm. well, that, I suppose it's, uh, it relates to the, the previous thing that <coughs> there in in. Buddhism, as in Hinduism and many uh, contemplative traditions, there are many uh, techniques that are developed, many methods. A method is always relative. That is to say, it belongs in a particular context. So it's never going to be a universal panacea. It's never going to be the truth. So key thing is learning some methods and seeing whether they work for you. Because the fact that they work well for other people doesn't necessarily mean they'll work well for you. And if they don't well, work well for you, that simply means you need to go and find some other methods. If you say, oh, Mr. Holy, whoever taught me this special method, therefore the method is good and there's something wrong with me, uh, that somewhat Calvinistic line is um, easy to get into, but probably not very useful. Because the Buddha taught many, many methods on the basis that everybody has a potential. And if we privilege the method over the person, it won't be very helpful. And when one method dominates others, the way the gray squirrels dominate the red ones in Britain, the way CBT is attempting to do in terms of therapy provision, it's very unhelpful because we need a kind of mixed ecology in which different plants, different animals will do well in different environments in the same way different people, that is to say, different individuals who have their unique constellation of habits, patterns, karmic confusions, and so on, they'll need a different pattern. So <clears throat> while being respectful towards the tradition, we need to find out what works for us. Then we need to be mindful of what's going on when something is working well. Because <clears throat> there's always a risk that when we have problems, we pay attention because we're anxious and upset. And then when everything's fine, la 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 la, we don't bother. But m mindfulness has to be about the good days as well as the bad. And if something seems to be working well, again, we want to say, well, what is this? How is this functioning? So I think in that way, you, you can't cheat yourself if you keep attending to what's going on. It's, it's when we think we've found the right solution and we collapse into it, something then sort of seals on the outside and there's a kind of complacency which brings a sort of sleepiness with it. And, and that will diminish the attention, I would think. But it's really important to make some experiments. Yeah, very much, very much. Again, I was thinking about uh, child rearing and the various kinds of ideas which have come in about when you should um, feed a child and should you pick a baby up if they're crying. And various kinds of theories have come up about whether you should or you shouldn't. But generally, in the end, you know, if, if the mother relaxes, 
they will they will move towards it and it's just exactly in that way an, an anxious thought arises inside you and your breath changes somebody smiles and you smile somebody tells you something sad and you feel sad and probably your shoulders droop a little bit as well and you lean towards them and, and, and concern shows itself and that's what's happening all the time these pulsations so generally speaking not making ourselves artificial but without judgment just observing oh this is what happens when that occurs this is what happens when that occurs and we start to see dependent co-origination as it's unfolding and then we can see how we lose that because of the importing of these artificial educational dogmas that we picked up along the way I should be like this you know, particularly in, in Britain we have this um, virus of niceness that people are trained to be nice so in, in the name of being nice we're actually dishonest so there's a sort of loneliness in our pleasantness now if we weren't so pleasant would we would we be more connected that's one social interpersonal aspect the other aspect though is would we be more tolerant of ourselves if we were less nice because if I know I'm not so nice maybe I wouldn't burden you with my expectation that you have to be nice so I could let you be more angry or selfish and just think well that's how people are and then we could muck in and get on with it because the the cult of niceness and Englishness with its shadow of intolerance they go together present every day in the Daily Mail <laughs> Because it's the shadow dimension, isn't it? If you artificially cook up a presentation, this is how I should be, this is how I have to be, you're not attending to what's going on. And actually, if we don't feel comfortable with someone, that's real information. If it's not <clears throat> a pre-existing prejudice that you've taken from somewhere else and projected onto the situation, the fact that we feel more at ease with some people than with other people means something. It can mean something about ourselves, about our own neurotic constriction, but it can also mean something about how they are manifesting their behavior. And so if we are wanting to work with circumstances, we have to allow ourselves to know what's there. So checking the breath, checking posture, checking gesture, allows us to have a sense of what our organismic being is feeling in relation to the evolving situation. Myself and then noticing in, in the last talk a bit well um, the kind of my kind of breath and breathing actually changed and altered into a much more marketable state um, when I was sitting quietly. Yeah. Yeah. That was really helpful to people, isn't it? Yeah. That people get to us. <laughs> 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 and that, that, that's a really good thing. Otherwise, we'd be endlessly lonely. You know, sometimes it, it looks at some, some of these Tibetan paintings, you see them, especially when they're in their little kind of circle of rainbow-colored light, and you can imagine them floating through space in some kind of bubble, which would be terribly tragic, wouldn't it? But that, that's not an armory around them. You know, it's, to, to be touched and moved is, is beautiful, but it has a cost. It has a cost. That is to say, compassion or availability costs us. And therefore, then the question is, <clears throat> is wisdom a way of resourcing compassion? Because if you resource your, your compassion, if you say, I want to be a good person, I want to help other people, and I can feel myself retreating, I feel I've had enough, but I'm going to go over that threshold and pressing the override button and I'm going to go beyond because of them the, the long-term outcome is probably not very good so we might start to examine what, what is the ground of my being what what is the place in myself out of which this gesture towards the other goes but also What's the place in myself which is the recipient, the, res the site of reception for whatever is coming towards me? 
So our little ego pot will not contain very much. And that's why in Dzogchen, which we'll come on to a bit later, the main focus is on relaxing and opening, because then we can take a lot more. As long as we are in the delimited identity of our habitual adaptions, our conditioning, our patterns, and so on, our capacity will be small. By definition, if you limit yourself, you'll be limited. You wouldn't be a surprise. The more we relax out of the limitation, the more we can cope with. And if we're going to be with people, we'll have to cope with a lot. Because the central question is, can I allow you to be who you are? On, on two levels, can I give you the space just to manifest as you are? That's the sort of outer level. It means not react by needing to correct you in terms of what I think is, is proper behavior. But secondly, inside you are being who you are, you are, of course, artificial. Because your, your free potential as a person is being mixed up with your, your habits and your limitations. You're doing a number. You're caught up in something. So how, how can I affirm the basic goodness of you as a person and at the same time take up a positioning that will help to untie your fusion with your limitations. Some of you may know the work of uh, Carl Rogers. That's a basic uh, proposition in his model of counseling. Three basic factors. Unconditional positive regard, meaning a complete openness of, and a full availability to the other. An empathic attunement that lets us really get into the nuances of how the other person is. And then a congruence, which is to say and I have, I exist as well. I'm part of this. I can't let you just be yourself on your own terms because I'm part of being with you. And therefore, I need to bring myself into the picture. So how can I bring myself into the picture without somehow reaffirming your limitation? So, for example, in therapy, somebody might be talking. You might say, at a certain point, I'm aware you've been talking most of the session. I don't know whether you want to hear anything from me. Very often the response to that is, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, as if the person has done something wrong. So it, it's quite difficult, isn't it, to, to help somebody see what they're doing without that suddenly flipping them into self-blaming and guilt and badness. Which, of course, is a replication of what's often happened in childhood. Kids are, small kids are just bopping around, having fun, and someone says, oh, for God's sake, shut up. Why do you need to do this? Oh, you always are. <gasps> and then they freeze, and they feel suddenly this big light has come onto them, and the, 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 the free expression of them just being themselves is suddenly overexposed, and, they, and you retreat, and that's what shame does. So it's, it's quite difficult for us to feel that everything about us is good. And I would suggest that only if we can do that, which from the Buddhist point of view is wisdom, can you then have real compassion, which is the absolute acceptance that, as it were, the unconditional positive regard, the infinite hospitality says, you're fine as you are, and you know, there's a few things that could be untied. But the things that can be untied are not the fundamental definition of who you are. They're just a few habits that you pick up along the way. So that in, in that way, we're trying to, as it were, drive a wedge between the fusion between the basic um, presence or uh, availability or liveliness or potential of a person and the habits that have been evolved through their interactions with the environment. Both are there. The former, the openness, is the, the authentic, if you like. It's, it's what's <coughs> the given. It's what's just there. The habits are also there presentationally. They have an impact. They affect our breath and so on. But they are constructs. 
So the more we can see that basically we are good in our openness and our potential, and we are constrained, and these constraints, when we look at them, they're not moral faults, but they are functional constraints. And if they are enacted in the world, they become, as it were, moral faults, because they bring grief to other people. But we all have limitations. So who is the one who is limited by my limitations? In the moment that I wed myself, in the moment that I fused myself into my limitation, I'm the one that's limited. When I start to be aware of my limitation, I'm not limited by my limitation. I'm actually freed by my limitation. Does that make sense? The more I can see how I tie myself in knots, the more I'm awake to the part of me that never gets tied in the knots. Because I start to see the difference between activity and awareness. That energy's activity swirls around, moves, and, and suddenly goes into little spirals, little maelstrom, in terms of, say, you're with a friend and you get into a fight and you feel really uncomfortable inside. And you can't think and you just don't want to be there. You're sort of whirling into this thing and you think, oh, God, this is awful. I can't bear this anymore. Suddenly you're very small. There's just this sort of condensation. So who is the one who can't bear it? You're saying to yourself, I can't bear it. Who is this one who says, I can't bear it? You can, in, as soon as you get that, you, you're immediately out of it and in it at the same time. Then you can be with that cusp-like movement, thinking truly in terms of how I feel, this is it. I am circumscribed, I'm small, I'm reduced. This is awful. And in knowing that it's awful, in really knowing it, I'm not in it. So if I pretend, oh, it doesn't matter, that would be a lie. If I say that's all there is, that would also be a lie. So the Buddhist teaching, as always, is the middle way. Both aspects are there, and we position ourselves right in the middle. I feel like shit today, and in knowing that, I don't. And yet I do. And it's that double move so that we don't have to change the object form. We don't have to change how we are in order to achieve freedom in it. Because actually, sometimes feeling bad is necessary if our life situation is bad. If, if your parents are, are very sick or they're dying, you would feel terrible. If someone's gone away and your heart's broken, you're going to feel terrible. It's, it's, to be a human being, to have compassion, it's absolutely vital that we can feel terrible. But who is the one who feels terrible? That is to say, you can fall into the terribleness and it becomes the definition of who you are, but you can also be aware, I feel terrible. And then you can just gently tilt and move between these two, sometimes in the feeling, sometimes aware of the feeling. If you're too far away from it, you become just sort of, it, it sort of spookily cool. And if you eat too much into it, you'll be a bit helpless. <coughs> Very often, we, we fall into things and we expect someone else to be present to bring us out of it. And that's what friends are for in many ways. But we can also learn to befriend ourselves by being with ourselves while we're in it. And it, it's these two aspects which are the, the heart of wisdom and compassion. Wisdom is knowing it's devoid of inherent self-nature, it's an illusion, it's like a dream. And compassion is the willingness to be in the world with others, which means they get to us and we feel all these things. And they're not two separate domains. So, we're going to have a break soon. In terms of mindfulness of the body, it's just, there's, there's posture. So, as we get up to go out, just be aware of getting out of a chair or getting up from the ground. The different tensings of muscles and releasings that are involved in elevating your body. Then you go to put your shoes on. That involves bending, tying laces and so on, putting on a coat. There's so much bodily movement involved in our just being in the world. 
So we're paying mindful attention to the tightening and uh, releasing of muscles, the position of muscles in relation to the skeleton, the tilt of the head, so we can be mindful of the weight of our head. If you're mindful of that, you're going to correct your posture. You don't need to do Alexander Technique, because Alexander Technique, in a sense, is a path of mindfulness. It's saying, what's happening? Observe what's happening. And if you really observe it, it you, you will become self-correcting, because you will start to feel the out of alignment. So we can start to do that, and then you go to a cafe, or maybe you stay here, whatever you do, but if you eat something, then there's the whole process of observing the impact of the color, the smell, then the taste, the movement of chewing, and so on. The feeling of hunger beforehand, satisfaction and satiation afterwards. Just being mindful of what that is. And, and that so much of our being is absolutely relational that my, my identity is I am a participant. I am not a distanced observer. I am not a separate individual. I am a participant. I am part of what's going on. Also, okay, so continuing with the uh, topic of mindfulness. The second of the four foundations is uh, often translated as mindfulness of feeling. Here, though, feeling uh, means uh, it's the kind of most basic sort of feeling or reaction or sometimes translated also as sensation. It means uh, that we react to something which is occurring as being either positive, negative, or neutral. Um, this is a very quick response to situations. So... For example, if you're uh, being mindful of the body and you're just seeing what is happening, it, it's usual that we want, would take a, a reading of that would occur quite soon. So, for example, if you become aware of a tightness in your chest, it's likely that that will evoke a negative feeling. You're aware of a constriction and immediately the senses go away I don't want this, or this is bad. And this is the quality of feeling. Uh, positive, negative, and neutral are enormously important in life. The neutral, <coughs> if we look at this from the point of view of entities, then if something exists, these are the three categories for making sense of it. That is to say, we always take up a position towards our experience. If we like it, we want more of it, we go towards it. If we don't like it, we want to protect ourselves from it, we go away from it. And we can also be indifferent to it. That is to say, it doesn't impinge on us enough to really register. So in terms of the general teachings on mindfulness, being mindful of these reactions becomes enormously important. Be <clears throat> because of some of the implications that we talked about before lunch. If, as soon as you take up a position, you're going to start to view the object with a particular kind of interest. So, if you think, I don't like this, the immediate thought then is, how could it harm me? And how can I protect myself from it? that clearly brings up a sense of wariness, of distancing. Instead of being open to the, the fullness of what this arising situation is, one's already put it into a category of unpleasant, dangerous, and so on, and therefore has turned oneself against it. So, implicit in particularly in the positive and negative plura uh, polarities, is a kind of prejudice. <coughs> so, I'm for something I agree with. That makes sense. 
it makes sense if one is in the freshness of the situation, because then one could <coughs> open oneself to something that's good. However, of course, things that are good don't stay good for always. And so the very strength of your alignment of I want this, when the mood changes and you suddenly decide that I don't want it, you might be stuck with it. So the glue of desire or longing or wanting or approving can lead one into difficult situations. Of course, very often <coughs> the approval of the object, the saying this is good or I like it, is not based on a very <coughs> direct, open apprehension of the thing in itself. What's happened is the object has been subsumed into a pre-existing category. I like it because it's an example, an exemplar of something I already know. And that is the basis of stupidity. My country, right or wrong? Why? If your country is wrong, why would you support it? Loyalty comes above thinking. This is why nationalism is one of the great poisons in the world. From a Buddhist point of view, any narrow identification is going to be dangerous, because all narrow identifications are based on the law of exclusion. I am British because I'm not French, and I'm Scottish because I'm not English, and I'm from Glasgow, and I certainly don't want to be from Edinburgh. And I'm from the west side of Glasgow, which means I don't like the people from the east or the south. <laughs> right down to my street, and I don't like the neighbours either. <laughs> and actually, I'm not all that fond of my brother. <laughs> so the world can become very, very small. So in that way, instead of being able to define oneself very precisely from the inside out, which of course is incredibly difficult, because we are so multiple, so complex, the simple way is to divine, d define ourselves by excluding the things we don't like. <coughs> so, if you say, my country is right or wrong, then clearly anyone who's against my country is my enemy. I don't need to think about it. And that uh, rapid-fire, automatic, knee-jerk response leads into great difficulty. If we have a special relationship with America, and endlessly have to sign blank checks without being able to think about it, this becomes very problematic. Thinking is difficult, because as soon as we start to think and analyze and explore, problems multiply. Events become complicated. Who will one make an alliance with? Who are the good guys? If everybody's a mix of good and bad, how will you cut the cake? How will you free yourself from enmeshment with problematic forces. It's extremely difficult. So, this uh, allocation of value, of trying to sort out what I like, what I don't like, what I'm safe with and what I'm not safe, can be an attack on any sort of real openness to the actual concrete emerging situation and also an undermining of our capacity to reflect on it, to walk around it, to see it as, it, as, as, it, as if it was a piece of sculpture, looking from different points of view, so that its different aspects reveal themselves. So, mindfulness of the immediate feeling tone response to a situation is very important. Because that uh, feeling tone is the beginning of assumption. It's grounded in assumption, and it's also the beginning of further assumption generation. I like something, it must be good. It's like comes into ordinary English language. How are you doing? Good. What good have you done for sentient beings today? No, I feel good. Oh. So, but you're not good. You just feel good. In fact, you feel okay or happy, and you think it's a good thing that you feel good or happy, 
there's a few things that are being condensed there. The fact that something pleases me doesn't make it good. In fact, many of the things that please us might, in fact, not be very good. As national obesity campaigns and alcohol awareness tend to remind us that many of the pleasures in life are actually not so good. And in fact, of course, we, what's good for the tongue is not necessarily good for the heart or the liver. So maybe it's all like the curate's egg, good in parts. That makes it then all the more necessary to be suspicious of one-liners. We are suckers, we are mugs for the one-liner. As we move towards the election, we'll be bombarded with sound bites, which are an invitation to become stupid. But our politicians can only do these things because we do them continuously to ourselves. Filling our mind with particular prejudgments, fixed points of view, which illuminate the phenomena in a particular way. Chocolate's really good. That could mean I like chocolate. What is chocolate good for? It's good for getting fat. It has a lot of calories in it, a lot of fat in it. So it's good for some purposes. If you're very skinny, you know, if you're an anorexic and you've decided to change your ways, our chocolate's very good. If you're not, if you're overweight, then chocolate's not good. So it's what's required here in this sort of mindfulness is to catch yourself in the process of applying a label, an identification, and just see what is the basis for the allocation of that label. That is to say, is this thing called a bar of chocolate good in itself? Or is it the fact that it becomes an object of desire for me, the basis for my saying it is good? And when I say good, what I like is the, the semiotic, the, the, uh, the meaningful, or the, the sight of multiple meanings that it can evoke. So the fact that I can conflate, I like it, with it has moral value allows me to eat more chocolate. Because I'm giving myself approval as if I'm doing a good thing by eating chocolate because it's good. It's a good thing to serve your country. It's a good thing to kill people. If you serve your country, you have to kill people. Therefore, it's a good thing to kill people. Now, that's a bit of a problem because, generally speaking, we say it's not a good thing to kill people but it is a good thing to defend your country. And, and it's these sort of conflations that make uh, military uh, preachers, uh, chaplains squirm, because they're incredibly difficult. There are two readings which should be kept separate. What you have is a category confusion. Two completely discrete, compartmentalized areas of discourse are being run together as if they're the same. So this uh, second foundation of mindfulness is to really observe how quick thinking, easy thinking, lazy thinking, labeling makes us not think. It's what commercial companies are doing all the time with the money they spend on advertising. They're trying to create symbolic identification with a logo, with a brand, so that if you come to rely on that brand, you will be willing to purchase everything in it because it will be reliable. For example, Marks and Spencers spend a lot of money exactly on this. We are a regular supplier, we're absolutely reliable, and you know you can trust us for quality. It's not necessarily true, but when people have that in mind, you relax and think, well, well that'll be okay if it comes from there. This is exactly the investment that we're trying to look at here. <laughs> because part of identification of phenomena involves investment of aspects of ourselves. In psychoanalysis, they call it libidinal cathexis. It simply means that the life energy that you have inside you 
your your um, aliveness, your uh, vibration of <coughs> connection and meaning and value becomes located inside a particular object. Now, that object may not be a very good object for it to be located in, but because we make bonds with the world through projection, through seeing what is good as outside ourselves, we become hooked on these particular objects. So, <clears throat> in this practice, and we're just you know touching on the edge of this kind of practice, we're trying to observe the immediacy of the allocation of interest and value to whatever is arising. And then to try to see what is the basis for this attribution. Is it habitual? Or is it on the basis of something which is truly revealed about the object? And even if it's truly revealed about the object, because the object reveals itself to us in a relationship, in a temporary juxtaposition when we encounter the object. As that pattern changes, the object may not have that value anymore. Do you like chocolate? Yes. After 10 bars of chocolate, you might not like chocolate. So part of the liking of something is the absence. As we, the old saying is, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Actually, absence makes all the sense organs grow fonder. If we hadn't heard music for a while, we want to hear music. If we haven't smelt some delicious perfume or spring flowers, we're so drawn towards that. But we are quickly satiated because what the yearning was for distraction, the difficulty of staying with what is there. Because just sitting, settling, waiting creates a kind of redundancy for the ego as active agent. If there's nothing for me to do, who am I? So again, one of the functions of meditation is to practice becoming the audience. Usually the ego wants to be on the stage, wants to be a performer, sometimes in the supporting cast, sometimes the star. But actually, we need to have time in the audience. We're just part of what's going on. We don't have a leading role. We can just applaud, think it's okay. We don't need to lead it or direct it. And this, of course, becomes increasingly important as people get older. It is um, very frightening for many people to get older and feel their physical energy draining away, becoming physically incompetent, not able to take care of themselves. And if they've been highly wedded to the notion of being an active agent, being in charge, it becomes almost intolerable, because they've never wanted to be the audience. So meditation has real value in letting us see that the world performs itself. Everything is going on if you just relax and wait. You don't have to be busy in making it happen. Sooner or later, something will happen. Just like in group therapy, you always get one or two people who just have to blether all the time. They leap in. As soon as there are silence, they're right in there, like a ferret up your trousers. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Because there's an anxiety, nothing's happening. And, and that takes us back to the neutral position. The neutral position is nothing. Children tend to find this very boring. They want something to be happening. And that something will then be either positive and I like it, or negative and I don't like it. But the idea that it's just nothing. We're just, we're just sitting. What will they do? They do, they're just sitting. I can't. That incredible need to make things happen, to be involved, to be an agent, to be one who makes a mark. And of course, if we're the audience, we're being marked. How to be marked without marking in reply can make us feel like a slave, a servant, 
as if we're being branded or somehow overdefined. <coughs> These things are, I think, are fairly easy to understand because they're what happens to us on a daily basis. So, when we do this, I just sit as before and observe, and you can start it in the relation between the body and the reaction. So, as you're sitting, various things arise and change in the body. You become aware of your posture, muscular tension, the movement of the breath, and so on. When you're aware of that arising, try to be mindful of the attribution that goes with it. The particular tilting, whether you move towards it or away from it. Because and this neutral position is particularly important here, because it's also the domain of cut off dissociated states. I don't care. Blanking out, zoning out. These are methods of defensive indifference, which is not a natural indifference, but it's a reaction against the fear of being impinged on, the fear that something's happening to me that I don't like. We get that a lot in therapy with children and with adolescents. It's so painful and difficult for them to describe their experience that they'd rather kind of play, and a lot of the therapy has to occur through playing different kinds of games so that uh, through gesture they can indicate some of what's happening. But if you have to say, uh, my father raped me, that is such a terrifying and annihilating thing to think, isn't it? as if your whole world collapses, that it's much better to say, well, I don't care. No, what, what, what happens? Surely something? Nothing? No? And, and it's not that they're... Uh, trying not to say something, it, it's just knocked out. There's, first of all, the retroflexion and then the uh, dissociation from that. People do that under extreme circumstances, but we also do that. So observing the positive and negative movement allows us to get a sense of what's intolerable. That is to say, if I'm still me, with my history, my personality, my sense of who I am, so many things have to be off the menu for me because they're contradicting my sense of who I am. So when we're starting to be mindful of this uh, quality of uh, immediate sensation, we're confronting the facticity of life. That is to say, the experience has already happened and now we're applying an attitude towards it. I like it, I don't like it, but it's already happened. And if you can just accept that, that's quite something. It's already happened. I'm still here, but I don't like it. So that's very, very interesting. What am I reacting to? The event has already happened. Because events just go by, the event has generated a narrative reading of what's happened. Thirdly, I can't bear that. Now, what is it that I can't bear? Is it number one or number two? Because the event's gone. What I can't bear is the knowledge of the event, that that would have happened. Actually, most of us have survived quite a lot in our lives. We've got through all this stuff. But so many people who have survived mountains of shit can't realize that they are truly powerful survivors because they can't bear the story of what they've been through, although they've been through it. You get the drift of that. It's enormously important. And so the strength, the courage, the continuity of existence, the, the, the vibrant capacity of the mind to be present in the midst of all sorts of unpleasant things is covered over because we can't bear knowing what has just happened, although we've survived what has just happened. So when we do this mindfulness, it's, it's observing also the constructions that we make about situations. Because so often the reason we can't bear something is not our basic capacity to bear, to endure, to survive, to go through, but it has to be, I don't know how to fit together 
my construction of who I take myself to be and the fact that this has happened. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that offers us again the chance to put into question the value of this rigid definition that we have of ourselves. Because actually, if we could survive it, and we're still here, maybe I'm not who I think I am. That is to say, maybe the root of identity is ontological. It has to do with the quality of being, the ongoingness of, of my immediate existence, rather than the maintenance of particular stories about myself. And in that movement, there's a huge freedom. Because if I am not the stories about me, who am I? That is yet to be revealed. That is yet to be revealed. That is always being revealed moment by moment. No one will ever catch me, and I can never catch myself. Always free and always engaged. Ah, it's incredible. Stepping right out of this constructed prison of a narrative definition of self. Okay, shall we try a bit of this practice? Just sit in a comfortable way, letting the skeleton do the work. And then... You can experiment for yourself, whether having your eyes open helps, or maybe sometimes try it with your eyes closed. <coughs> Being mindful of what's happening in the body, and then once you've got a sense of that, just being aware of these feeling tone responses that are occurring. <coughs> Just disc discussing with a neighbor, see if you can identify how you become aware of this uh, movement of positive or negative attribution. Is it uh, cognition? Is it something that arises after the fact because you found yourself aligned into an arising, not resisting it, and therefore you could intuit that that means positive, or you've turned away from it and tried to install something else and therefore negative. See if you could get some sense of how that functions for you. Okay. Um, any uh, responses to that experience? We were just realizing how much you can exhaust yourself in the course of a day by adding little things. We were both kind of became very aware of heartbeats. Mm -hmm. and they were, they were feeling, What's happening here? <laughs> and, so on, and all sorts of little things. I heard my stomach rumble and thought, Oh my goodness, and then heard other people's and thought, Oh, that's all right then. <laughs> <laughs> and so we making really brought it on to how much we're dealing with that all the time. Mm. And I tried it. Mm. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thoughts, yeah? Um, for me, um, that stirred up a lot of desire in me for some strange I don't know why, but I just found I was quite ruled by desire, you know. Instead of, I tried to keep myself balanced, but mm -hmm. for some reason, a lot of desire came to me. Mm. Who knows? Well, who knows? But, I mean, that's often the case, though, isn't it? That we. We, we move towards objects. We're, I mean, the whole uh, structure of our body with our uh, sense organs directed towards the front means that we, we, we're moving out towards the environment. And it's usually only if we come across something we don't like that we pull back, uh, which has advantages because it keeps us engaged. But what, what, what is it that drives the desire or the hunger? You know, in the sense that we're, we're intentional as creatures, we're looking for something. 
but what do we imagine it would be that would give real satisfaction? Because the various objects we meet give only temporary satisfactions, and then we're on the treadmill again, moving and moving and moving. So that's maybe an important thing just to observe. Any other things you'd like to share? It's an interesting thing because the sort of bare noting of something, in a sense, gives you uh, sort of nouns. It gives you something like hot, cold. Um, but once you start to elaborate, you get all the adjectives and adverbs and you get more elaborated positions. And the desire to elaborate takes us into narrative because we want to make sense of it. And actually, a lot of experience is meaningless. It's just stuff. So we hear a car going by. Where's that car going? Who cares? I mean, the person driving it cares. It has nothing to do with us. But the noise of their car has come into our world. Or an airplane goes overhead, or suddenly you get an itchy scratch, and then it's gone. Why, why did I have a... So there's stuff arising and passing all the time, and it's just movement. It, it doesn't signify anything else. It is what it is. And so if we're not, as it were, satisfied with its bare appearance and need to cook it and turn it into something else, we'll endlessly have fuel for, for being busy. And, and I suppose it's in that way that we've, we've captivated by the possibility of cognitive control. That if I get enough clear thoughts and can link them up, I will know what's what, and my life will be rich and deep and meaningful. But in fact, an awful lot of what happens is to us in our life is just meaningless stuff. Now that needn't take us into some sort of existential despair or like that image of uh, from Van Gogh of the prisoners going round and round and round. You know, it's not it's not necessarily negative. It's just a neutral fact. It's just stuff. But I don't want that to be the case. I want something else. I was always struck by my unwillingness to tolerate things. It's really starting to feel contact and then just not wanting to tolerate. I was kind of blanking out. Or then. I can have talked to Gordon, it's a bit like, you know, that tolerate, it's almost so intolerable. The way of discharging it is not to let it, like you say, arrive. It's just, it's time to pick a fight, so I can discharge it like that. Mm -hmm. So I'll find a way of picking a fight or something wrong, or, but I can just really, you know, there's so much of this kind of inter, this looping and sometimes seeing something like that. And it happens, all happens so quickly, I don't even know why I'm picking a fight, but there's something about not being able to tolerate. Oh. Um, yeah. uh, life force or something. Mm -hmm. And the only way to tolerate it is to force it to create this thing that happens either by the way they're going around halfway, you know, just kind mm -hmm. of go into this. And there I am on my old number again. Mm -hmm. That's not happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, just like that. Yeah. No one, I'm all right, I'm into it. It's very odd. It's all very. So it sounds like there's a very rapid movement from a sense of this is happening to this is happening to me. Because if it's just something that's happening, 
there's a, there's a kind of gap. It doesn't really matter. But if it's happening to me, then it's who is it intolerable to me? If it's just there, these things happen. On this Saturday afternoon, there are people in hospital. That's very difficult for them. We feel sad about them, but you know, basically we can tolerate the notion that there are people in hospital. If we were in hospital, we might be finding that difficult to tolerate. In the sense that if there's a gap, it's just something in the world. It has some sort of impact, but not very strong. But it's exactly that ownership of it that, that confronts us with the question of our capacity. And maybe at this point we could start to link this to the notion of uh, the three root afflictions or poisons. We have stupidity, uh, aversion, and attraction or desire. Now, stupidity uh, you can also see as a kind of mental dullness, sort of not getting it, but it's also more dynamically a state of assumption that we assume something to be the case. For example, we assume that we exist. Clearly we're here, we're alive, we're present. What are we present as? Me. I'm here. I exist. And as we've looked at other times in Methods Field, you know that this becomes a, a kind of solipsistic swirl. Someone's having an experience. Who is the one having the experience? Me. Who am I? Well, I'm the one having the experience. And it just chases its tail round and round and round. And that's the core nature of stupidity. A kind of impenetrable screen of identification with fixed cognitions, which prevents the one having the experience putting themselves into question. So, the very fact that I'm saying I exist contracts myself into a position. So there's a kind of affirmation of this particular unique meanness of me, which is affirming in some way, but I've now diminished and shrunk myself. I've kind of nailed my colors to the mask. This is who I am. And of course, that then means I have a limited capacity. Because of being this, there will be some things I like and, and some things I don't like. Some you know, things uh, can fit together or not fit together. And according to how we construct the, the core definition of ourselves, certain things can be brought together or not brought together. So it's the very reification and objectification of our existence. I exist as an entity. I am a separate person. Which leads into, this is happening to me. If we simplify that down and say, this is happening, there is a no, and the facticity of this is happening is revealed through a bare awareness there is an impersonal awareness which is still me because it's my awareness there's all the vitality and freshness of existence in that but without that sort of condensation or centripetal movement movement into the center of definition this is happening to me because as soon as it's this is happening to me I like this I don't like that and in all the Buddhist traditions, there are many different methods for trying to tease open and unlock this contraction into a fixed definition of oneself, particularly on the experiential level, so that open, naked awareness can be present with whatever is occurring and included in part of what is occurring is the particular patterning of I, me, myself. 
so that awareness contains within it the definitions of the personality but not the other way around it's not that my individual personhood my unique private as it were personality that doesn't contain awareness that is revealed in awareness but it's not the owner of awareness it's not the agent of awareness and essentially that's what ignorance is in Buddhism it says for lifetime after lifetime you have been wandering in samsara in a state of ignorance what is the basic ignorance there is a dog but when you look at the dog you say the tail is the dog the Buddha comes into the world and says no the dog is the dog the tail is the tail that's the deep teaching of the Dharma <laughs> The dog is the primordial unborn awareness, and it has a tail. That tail wags, and that's who you are. You're just wandering through your life, happy, sad. This is unreliable, unstable, but there. It's not who you are, it's not the whole story, it's part of the story. The big arena, the big stage in which this story is enacted, is awareness itself. So, all that's required is to just recenter oneself. Because these two phenomena have never been separated. It's not that anybody's lost their Buddha nature or lost the ground of their being. Their being is manifesting out of its own ground all the time. But through the misapprehension, the mistaking of a manifesting uh, display as being the core identity, one is ceaselessly trying to hold in shape and maintain a fixed sense of self. And this is an impossible task. Because as we were looking in the morning, events touch and move us. When the dog sniffs something nice, its tail starts wagging. You know, when something moves through the domain of awareness, there is a movement. That's all. Awareness reveals subject and object without separation. Now, we know this. We're sitting in this room, and we look around the room. We can construe this in, in several ways. One way is to say, I, living inside my skin bag, look out at this world which is out there me inside you outside and when we are strongly fused with the sense of our individual self that's exactly how it feels like we feel a bit small and diminished I'm just a person in a big world and all this stuff going on and I've never quite really understood what life was all about and I've tried my best but things keep fucking up and I don't really understand, and you know, all the sort of neurotic stuff that whacks through our heads. Well, we can relax a little bit. We're just here. What happens if I'm just here? What am I aware of? We're aware through our senses, cars, building, people, and we're also aware, body. Even if I close my eyes, I still hear things. I feel the sensation of my feet on the ground. I'm aware of the cushion under my feet. That is to say, the object field or the environment and my subjectivity arise together. I am never truly alone because I am always experiencing myself in the environment. So, the non-duality of self and other is what we are living all the time. Because how I come into the world depends on the context. If I go away from other people, go into a solitary retreat, for example, still have practice to do. I arise as I am in relation to the practice. If I have nothing to do, 
I won't know who I am, which is why solitary confinement is such a punishment. People are kept on their own without books or music or noise. Sometimes the light is taken away and people generally start to go a bit crazy because I find myself through being with you. What I call me is incomplete. It's always me plus. Me plus you, me plus you, me plus you. Me plus the morning, me plus the evening. That is to say, the self is always contextual. <coughs> That's enormously important. And because it's contextual, it cannot be autonomous. <coughs> Autonomy is a completely uh, false notion. It's useful for describing certain patterns of manifestation, but it cannot define the, the true nature of the person, because we are fundamentally relational. So, the central point of stupidity is we don't recognize that we are always already connected with other people, that we are energetic forms manifesting in a sphere of interaction, and we assume I exist as a separate thing, me, and therefore I need to protect myself. I need to stop the things I don't like and get more of the things I do like. And this is the basic nature of what are seen as the three core poisons. Because the one who is protecting themselves doesn't know what they want. This is a real problem. What do we want? We don't know. You think back in the course of your life, all the decisions you've made, have they been wise? The classic term for this is, it seemed a good idea at the time. <laughs> and then the time changed, and then, what was that all about? How did that happen? God, what was I doing? What was I thinking of? Oh, you were thinking it was a good idea. <laughs> That should give us pause to think, oh, maybe relying on thoughts as the ultimate arbiter of meaning and value is not a good idea. Maybe thoughts themselves are overvalued, that cognition has, like a cuckoo, it's pushed the other aspects of our intelligence out and settled into this nest and consumes all the food and keeps insisting thinking will, will show what's what. It's probably not the case. And the times when we have maybe been safest and made good judgments is when it's been a deep intuition. <coughs> and that feeling of deep intuition is the, is the feeling tone of actually being connected directly with the environment. When you start to trust what your belly tells you. So the more that's the case, one can start to relax and see that these pul pulsations of attraction and aversion are simply communicative modes. They're not carrying any inherent truth inside them. They're just relational. That the things that we don't like, that's simply a gesture. Because if we're embodied, we have to, we have to choose something. So we went to the Heritage Center for lunch and there's a menu. You have to choose something off the menu. It's not a big deal, but you have to do it. What will I have? I don't know. Look at the menu. What is the stuff? I don't know. Anyway, we say something. Something comes, we sort of eat that. And that's what we're eating. What do I really want? I don't know. It's a false question. How could I know what I really want? If there isn't a real me, which is a fixed thing, all we have is passing fancies. This is Prospero's Island. This is a realm of dreams, a realm of illusion. So to want to have a concrete, definite truth, it's, it's a kind of madness. You're asking for something you can't have. What you can have is participation in an emerging field with others, and that participation if it's imbued with wisdom and compassion, can be light, connective, delightful, pleasing, valuable. But it won't establish anything stable. 
you won't be safe in your manifestation because that's not what manifestation is. It's unsafe. It just is. Just thing in the paper when I was coming up, some woman came out of her house and sees someone sitting in her car. She says, oh, what are you doing? And he drives the car after and kills her. What? Just the, the previous day, some Sikh man, there was a picture of him in the papers, gorgeous looking guys, builder, beautiful hair, just fantastic, healthy looking person. Somebody's doing something and chases him down the street and they kill him. Out between life and death, there's not a thick wall. People are dying all the time, car accidents and so on. Our life is so fragile. So, of course, we have to be mindful or careful and do our best to protect it. But it's not a solid thing. You can't turn it into a gold bar and put it in a Zurich bank account. It's, it's alive as participation. We will die if we retreat. Like Howard Hughes, locking yourself inside a room, inside a room, inside a room. So it is risky to be alive, and what keeps it safe is being present in the moment <coughs> through the senses. And we're most able to do that if we're not locked in the convolutions of our uh, mental labyrinth, chasing one thought after another after another. So these three poisons are essentially ways of tightening up and resisting the relaxation that comes from relaxing into an open presence. Open presence means simply there is no limit to what can be received. There is no way of being overwhelmed because there is a place for it. Now, why don't we want to have that. It's exactly as we were looking earlier. Because if I was that open, I wouldn't be me. I don't want to stop being me. Therefore, in order to maintain myself and ignoring the fact that I'm going to die, I will hang on to being who I think I am and try to maintain a fixed frame of reference from the Buddhist point of view, well, when you die, that fixed frame of reference, all the familiar things of your life, will dissolve. And you'll find yourself moving into a rebirth somewhere else. Somewhere else where you have none of the currency in your pocket. You won't have a clue what's going on. Then gradually you start to find your way and then pop your clogs once again and off you go, round and round and round. <coughs> so, Trying to maintain a narrow focus has no deep or essential value inherent in it. What has deep value is a relaxed state of openness which can actually manage to welcome and contain whatever occurs. Which is why, you know, when you look at some of these uh, paintings on the walls, you see wrathful deities. You see what are called gods, but they're jumping up and down. They've got flames coming out of them, and they don't look very nice. You think, on a Saturday night, when this bloke's a bit pissed, I'd like to be in another town. <laughs> this looks like a hooligan. And they are hooligans, because they want to destroy something. What do they want to destroy? the false reliance on a narrow view of self. That is to say, they represent killing. But we are good people. We don't like killing. We want love. If we all loved one another, we wouldn't need to think about killing. People wouldn't be unkind. The world would be better. But unfortunately, the world is full of killing and unpleasant things. We are fighting a war. Our boys are out there killing on our behalf. That's what they're doing, killing people. We believe in killing. We believe in killing before we are killed. We are structured into murder. 
This is part of our life. I don't want that to be the case. Okay. I have decreed from this day on, no one will do any bad things. Mm -hmm. Have you all heard? Mm -hmm. Are you going to do it? <laughs> oh, I can't threaten you though, because if I say you'll be in trouble if you don't, then I'll be doing a bad thing. Well, just please do it. Please be good. It's, it's nothing, it doesn't work. That's why in Tibetan Buddhism you have the peaceful gods and the wrathful gods. Because the please, please does a bit, but not the whole story. The fact is there are many unpleasant things, difficult things, which need to be incorporated, need to be accepted. This is part of existence. Desire, longing, lust, murderous feelings, jealousy, rage. As long as we are saying these are terrible negative qualities and they diminish me, I mustn't have them. We're all the time trying to purify ourselves by splitting ourselves, by trying to cut off aspects of ourselves and push them outside. On the other hand, we can leap into indulging them, but that's another way of lostness. The middle way is to see these are energy forces inside ourselves. I can accept this is how I am. Now, with these as a resource, how can they be mobilized in a way that's useful? What needs to be said? How can my anger be useful to challenge things? How can the feelings uh, of irritation which arise be something which are giving accurate information about the field and therefore don't need to be interpreted as there's something wrong with me? I wish I was a better person. That is to say, maybe our basic emotions, if we stop indulging them, either by merging with them or trying to get rid of them, maybe they show us, as we have a healthier relationship with them, they're just giving feedback about what's going on. That's all. Just feedback. And if we then use that feedback, then the immediacy of our response in a situation will just be there. For example, uh, in the course of a day, I see many different patients in the hospital and I behave in different ways with the different patients. Because there isn't a standard uh, package to be given to them. There is the fact that if I relate to them, how they are affects me and what can come out of my mouth. I can say some things very easily to one person, and the next person comes into the room and there's no way I could say what I just said. So, with some patients, confronting them very, very strongly is incredibly useful. With other patients, it would be completely the wrong thing to do. So rather than thinking, oh, I need to get better at confronting, I can observe, oh, something's going on that I don't confront this patient. And usually if we really inquire into it, and the non-confrontation isn't due to my own neurotic placation and anxiety, it's telling me something about the quality of the interaction. So this is uh, at the heart of having a more hospitable awareness, an awareness that allows everything to be here as communicative about the moment rather than carrying profound meaning that which will be eternal. Does that make sense? So by living connected with what's going on, what is revealed in the moment allows me to respond. That response had absolute validity in the situation. It doesn't really have much validity outside. This is why these damnable people, the Ofsted inspectors, are causing mayhem everywhere. Because they're asking people to be eternally accountable. You must justify what you have done. Oh, your justification doesn't fit my template, therefore you did something wrong. But they weren't in the place at the time. But we can't trust people to be in the place at the time because we know some people are very bad. Therefore, in order to keep us all safe, we're going to deal with everyone as being bad and delinquent all the time, and the only good people are the inspectors. <laughs> 
happiness. Good old Gordy. <laughs> this is despicable. This is the culture of fear. But of course we know this inside ourselves because we do this to ourselves. No politician would be able to do it to us if we weren't already doing it to ourselves. That we have these internal suspicious critics and we don't really trust ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're kind of not quite sure of whether we can relax and be spontaneous because maybe we get it wrong and I don't want to do the wrong thing and all that sort of anxiety which seems to be somehow making us safe and making us better people. But the possibility of this kind of practice is to really investigate it. What are these spirals of arousal which come in? What function does our anxiety have? Does it keep us on the straight and narrow? Because if so, then we're probably working from a basic assumption that we are bad, something is wrong with us, and only by worrying about it and keeping on our own case and driving ourselves can we possibly be at all acceptable. That is a very, very bleak vision, a sort of Hobbesian view of the world. Actually, from the Buddhist point of view, especially the Dzogchen point of view, from the very beginning our nature is completely pure. There is no fault, there is no error in awareness. Awareness has never been marked or damaged or harmed or mixed up with anything else. If one can truly accept, my nature is open, pure and perfect. Within that nature, which is like the mirror, our behavior arises, our thoughts, feelings and sensations. These have some little spirals in them. But the way to release these spirals and knots and tensions is not by trying harder, by driving ourselves, by berating ourselves, but by integrating the manifestation into its own ground. To see that out of the infinite spaciousness of natural awareness, thoughts, feelings and sensations are ceaselessly arising. And the more they're linked to the ground, the more they instantly release. The more we cling on to them as being something, which is the basis of stupidity, the more they get into adhesions. And these adhesions uh, create pain and difficulty. So this is a, a central issue about whether we decide we have to try harder, which in the uh, Theravadan commentaries on the uh, Mahasati uh, Patana Sutra, it's Mindfulness Sutra, they're always saying try harder, try harder. From the point of view of Sokshen, one's more inclined to say take it easy. Don't judge yourself too harshly. Observe how you are. What are the causes and conditions through which you get tied in knots? What are the causes and conditions whereby these knots try to start to unloosen? This is the main work, to observe what tenses you up and what releases that tension. Okay, if we take a, a short break here and then we'll continue doing some practice. So, <coughs> to link uh, what I was just talking about with the mindfulness, um, the central point, or the central point of differentiation between traditional Theravadan mindfulness and uh, the kind of more general uh, mindfulness that you will find in Sokshen is an attention to the one who is being mindful. When you read the uh, Theravadan accounts of mindfulness practice, it, it gives an encouragement. You need to energetically uh, attend to, for example, uh, what is arising as the colorations of consciousness, what, what mental factors are arising. Who is going to do it? You're going to do it. Who are you? That sort of on the next page. Then you turn the page and it's on the next page. <laughs> It's, ne it's never really directly addressed because 
The one who's doing it is the five skandhas. So who is investigating consciousness? Is consciousness investigating consciousness? Now, how could consciousness investigate consciousness? There's a kind of uh, taken for grantedness about that. So, so, when we say you must apply effort, well, we all know what that means. You must try harder. Okay, I'll try harder. But what is actually occurring then? So, in the Dzogchen tradition, we're very concerned to observe who is the one who acts. What is the nature of agency? When we talk about me doing something, what does that mean? Because actually what we're talking about <clears throat> is narrative accounts of something. But what is the actual phenomenology of the arousal of energy as it moves towards an object? And the Dzogchen teachings says, from the very beginning, your own mind has been completely perfect. This means that the mind is not a thing, it's not a construct. Now, in this room there are people who speak different languages. Some people speak French, some people speak German, and so on. Well, we're speaking in English. We speak in English because we all understand English. We weren't born understanding English. We've learned it. Some people learned it very early in their life. Some people learned it later in their life. All that we construe and think and do inside English is a set of learnt pieces. This is uh, a language game. Uh, in Wittgenstein's notion of a language game, you enter into the game, you learn the rules, and you act according to the rules as if it was meaningful. Just as if you learn to play rugby, there are certain rules that you follow, and if you follow the rules, the game goes well. If you break the rules, the ref blows his whistle and you can get thrown off. But generally speaking, when you play rugby, you play rugby. When you play football, you play football. If you touch the ball when you are um, playing football and you're not the goalie, that's not a good thing, unless you're South American or French. <laughs> <laughs> in rugby you can touch the ball and the similarity would be that when we were born we were born into a particular language game the language game of our family and we learned to take the rules of our family as as it were self-existing they were there before we were born we come into it and it just seems to be how things are then, of course, we go to school and we learn different kinds of language games. And we tend to move seamlessly between these language games. That is to say, we learn to uh, comport ourselves in different social settings with a degree of ease and appropriateness. What often doesn't happen, though, is that we think, hang on a minute, I keep changing these things. What's real? I'm taking each of these things to be real. But it can't really be real, because if it's truly real, what's the rest? All of the games, if we believe in them, seem to be truly real. When one of the games collapses, you can feel very sad. Uh, I remember my father talking about the end of the Second World War when he was in the Indian Army, and saying... You know, they started to get all this stuff that the government was pumping out about a land fit for heroes and what it was going to be like. But um, that wasn't actually what happened. You know, people are invited to believe that something is the case, and we are willing, because we're mugs and suckers, we're willing to believe that almost anything is the case, and we act as if it's the case, and then suddenly we're betrayed because. We were taken in. We fused with a language game and took it to be real. Football is a game. It's not life. Despite what the t-shirts say. <laughs> and all of the things that we do in samsara are just games, or in Buddhist language, is an illusion. It's like the reflection of the moon and water. 
these things arise due to causes and circumstances for a while and then they're gone and when you were captivated by them they seem to be completely real and then they're gone it's just gone all that remains is the the traces created by one's own orientation during the time of one's participation traditional language that's called karma it means to say tendencies that you develop while in a game that you were taking as real when we start to see that things are not so real and that our being in the world with others is a display of energy that we are living in this participative theater I make a gesture you make a gesture you make a gesture I make a gesture these pulsations of connection and movement that's all we have that's all we have and it can be done collaboratively or conflictually generally speaking our lives go better when it's collaborative but for some reason we imagine that conflict is a better way so in our British political system we have a very conflictual system two major parties who hate each other and whack the shit out of each other all the time some other European countries have very collaborative systems they don't have dominant political parties they usually have alliances and coalitions and they often get a lot more done because the mood is we're all in it together and although we have differences the differences can be contained within the trajectory of more general well-being so that's a very helpful metaphor for us to think of what is the, the general organizing principle that allows us not to annihilate difference but to work with difference towards the general wealth being you're not homogenizing people but you're also not getting paralyzed by difference so in terms of here we are in this room aware of everything conscious of quite a few things consciousness is always more narrow than awareness that is to say I am conscious of you sitting there while I'm aware of these other things they are impinging but I'm not consciously processing the other things because I'm consciously attending to you so one is focused and affirms subject object and the connection between the two whereas awareness is more panoramic and allows the presenting of whatever is occurring consciousness is always changing as the object changes so the consciousness changes and that's the ongoing movement of our lives that's occurring within the mirror the revealing space of awareness and the mirror itself doesn't change when you have a mirror the reflections change but the mirror per se the mirror itself doesn't change so this is the essential difference that when we relax into the presence of our being there is enough space for everything we're not going to get overwhelmed and so we don't need to anxiously edit things in terms of good bad for me against me and so on we can just allow them to be there because no reflection can destroy a mirror a hammer can destroy a mirror but a reflection can't something really horrible really gross put in front of a mirror won't crack the mirror and that's why in the Tibetan tradition it says the nature of the mind is indestructible that's what Vajra means it means <coughs> because there is no substance to it because it is open and empty and it's open other and empty because it's not like anything in the world and yet it is inseparable from everything in the world this indestructible awareness offers infinite hospitality to whatever's there Whew. then we can relax it's okay the, our, the ego aspect of ourselves is going to be tremulous and upset because the ego cannot cope with everything but awareness can cope with everything and we are both this 
limited physical existence and an infinite awareness. It's not a case of either or, but the integration of these two main modes. If you open to your awareness, you can still be hit by a car and die. People who get uh, some kind of awakening or enlightenment still die. It doesn't stop the body having the logic of the body. But you don't have all your eggs in one basket. If you think, I am just this physical form, and when I die, that's it. It's all up to me. I've got to get the most out of life. I've got to do my best. These incredible pressures and driving forces can make us crazy. Because how do you get the most out of life? What's the best thing to do? Someone I know has gone to Bali for the winter. And uh, having a nice time. She sent me a postcard, nice picture on the front. The inside she said... Her daughter had sent her a message describing all the snow that's around, and she feels incredibly sad because she loves snow. <laughs> <laughs> and she lives in Brecon on top of a hill in Wales, and she's just imagining all the snow all around. And I'm reading the postcard, imagining her in Bali. And all <laughs> like that. What will make me happy? How will we know? So it, it, sense of if we if we try to be present with whatever is occurring we will always be where we are and what this is suggesting is that to put it in another language ontology precedes and is more important than epistemology that is to say the quality of being of being oneself just open and present is more important than any interpretation or understanding that can arise because every understanding vanishes. It just vanishes. You may have had the experience in school or later in college and university or further later in your lives of maybe writing an essay and you get into it, you really like it, you finish it, wow, and then it's gone. You hand it in, maybe you get a good mark. What do you do then? It's gone. It was just a moment. You fall in love, it's just a moment. You eat a good meal, it's just a moment. Nothing can be grasped. You can't take it with you. But if you can't take it with you, you're still going. Someone is always there. Who is the one who is always there? Since you were born, you've always been you. You haven't been the same size. You haven't been doing the same things. You haven't had the same interests or the same friends since you were born. But somehow, you've always been you. What is that you of you? That is the unborn natural condition. That's the nature of the mind itself. Relaxing into that, the various turbulent movements of life, happiness, sadness, closeness and distance, they just come and go. But under all circumstances, we can still be here. So that's the the central point of the difference between Sokhshen and the Theravada. The third foundation of mindfulness is mindfulness of the mind, uh, of citta. <coughs> the mind, in this sense, is not the open awareness, but what we might call the site of mentation, the site of mental activity, including memory, planning, thoughtfulness, and so on. The mental content of our mind is pervaded also by these three poisons we were looking at earlier. That is to say, a lot of our thoughts are repetitive, follow familiar patterns. We have our own private obsessions, likes and dislikes. That's the realm of stupidity, the sense of, I know who I am. I'm, I'm, I can define who I am, the story of myself. And then inside that, we have the movement of attraction and resistance to particular thoughts. This level of experience is not normally revealed to us in our everyday life. But when we sit to meditate, when the external stimuli are removed, and we're just with ourselves, we become much more aware of the internal turbulence. We become aware of leaping into some thoughts, fusing with them, trying to keep other thoughts at bay, feeling 
that they're toxic or poisonous. There's a kind of revulsion to them. And that we have a discontinuous sense of self in that we're in one thought and then suddenly we're in another thought. We, we might even consciously intend to do something like track the breath and suddenly we're gone. That's very similar to what happens when we're dreaming. You know, if you sometimes remember a long dream, you're, you're in one particular scenario and then for some reason you jump out a window and then you're on the train. And So how did you get out the window onto the train? It's just, just as you're meditating, you're following the breath and suddenly you're off back at work or you're thinking about a friend. And you're completely in that. And then that comes to an end. So these mental events are permeated by this is these three factors. This is real, and because it's real, either I like it or I don't like it. So when we practice this mindfulness, just in the same way, we sit quietly, and we start to observe the content of our thoughts and how we stand in relation to the content of the thought. That is to say, if we had three families of thoughts, and we like a postman, it's a very small village, there's only three pigeonholes. So we've got um, kind of uh, neutral or indifferent, aversive and fusional or attractive. Yeah? So whatever is arising, you can just see these three categories as operating. These are the general categories. In so, of course, they have all sorts of subdivisions. But in these three general categories, almost every kind of mental event can be located. So at first, we're just trying to do that. One of the functions of this, of course, is it gives a kind of protective, prophylactic uh, force to save us from being so caught up in thought. Because if we are mindfully attentive to what is arising, the proactive quality of that kind of pulls us together. We're not so dispersed. You know, when we're on about something, we sort of gather our resources, maybe not even so much blinkered, but we're sort of all of a piece. We're moving in the same direction. So the intentionality of the mindfulness antidotes dispersal and brings the clarity to seeing the structural quality of the thought rather than being caught up in identification with the semantics of it. Does that make sense? So let's try that a wee bit. So again, we'll sit for about 10 minutes. Just allow your mind to move freely, thoughts, feelings and so on. And just attend to what is the particular turn that you would uh, see these uh, arisings as having. Okay. And that's something <clears throat> from practice again and again. It's quite difficult to do because what, what you're asking yourself to do is to keep an eye on something which is rolling free. That is to say, if you let the mind run free, to precisely keep an eye on it is more difficult. What is, what is the quality of what is arising in the moment? So, for example, it's not that... Uh, somebody comes and knocks on your door and you look at your little CCTV screen to see whether you like the look of them or not before you open the door. There is no door in the mind. When the thought arises, it's arising as you. It's already got you before you know what's there. That's the difficulty. That's why um, observing the mind is incredibly difficult because the the edge whereby there is an observer and an observed, it's not like being inside your body and looking out your eyes, where by turning your head just very quickly, you can disrupt the absorption into being fixated on one person. When you're in your thoughts, you can't do that. So it's, it's a very, very subtle nuanced thing to do. But with some practice, you get 
a bit more clarity and you can be present with what is arising and it's just to feel the tilt of it is it that one wants more of this thought or less of the thought very few neutral thoughts arise generally speaking they, they're all pervaded with the degree of desire <coughs> and this desire is different from the desire for, I don't know, mango milkshake. It's not that it's something nice and I'd like to have that experience again. It's a much more existential desire. That is to say, I need to be fused with something in order to exist. Because the ego, like the mind, has no shape or color itself, it finds its existence by haunting like a ghost it occupies the space which is filled with something else so I say this is what I'm thinking now that means a thought arose and I identify with it and say this is what I'm thinking but you know I could say I am raising and lowering my arm and there's a degree of intentionality I can reach over and touch the glass or not, but I can't make a thought really. Occasionally, of course, say you're doing a school exam or something like that, you sit down and you struggle to think what the answer might be, but most of the time it's not like that. Streams of thoughts are arising and we are allowing them to come through, especially as these thoughts move into language and we find ourselves speaking. So. I'm already in it. Well, what does that mean? This is where it becomes meditation becomes very interesting. Who is the one who is experiencing the thought? This is at the heart of Dzogchen and all the tantric practices. Without this, the practice of tantra becomes empty <coughs> because it's a, just a lot of words. The main thing is one has to be present in the moment of engaging in the practice. How do we do that? We start with the state of awareness. The experience arises into that. And then it's gone. That is to say, if you look from the point of view of a subject examining an object, it's very difficult to observe your mind which is why a great deal of meditation practice people struggle again and again and again to do it I am trying to do something to myself almost impossible the key thing is if you relax and you open there is a spaciousness of clarity within which it's arising because awareness is then not actively trying to uh, do it or make it. It's not like um, somebody who's been employed at short notice to work the spotlight in a theatre. They've never seen the show. Ta -da, the curtain opens and the dancers run on and they've got to keep the spotlight on the central dancer but they don't know what the fuck the central dancer is going to do. <laughs> That's what we end up in the meditation. You don't know where the thought's coming from. <laughs> Why didn't they give me the script? I've only had seen it before. But because the mind's always fresh and new, you don't catch it. So, this is why in Soxen they use the image of the mirror a lot. The mirror reveals what's there without effort. The mirror doesn't run around trying to find something and focus on it. It just reveals what presents itself. So, when we do the practice, first of all, we just sit relax into the out-breath and then see what arises so what we're doing is relaxing the habit of intentionality or in another way we're uncoupling intention and attention in many of the general uh, med meditation methods Theravadan, Mahayana, Tantric intention and attention go together I'm setting out to do something but an intentional attention 
finds it very difficult to catch the spontaneous moment. It can visualize a mandala, it can observe the breath, it can do something which is standard, predictive, and noble in advance. But for tracking the spontaneous, the intention has to relax so that all the attention can be relaxed into a pervasive awareness rather than focused into a spotlight. Is that making sense? Yes. So that's at the heart of, of the practice, and tomorrow we'll do more of that. The fourth aspect of uh, the traditional foundations of mindfulness is called uh, mindfulness of dharmas. And dharmas mean, the word means a whole range of things. It means phenomena, external phenomena, internal mental phenomena, and it also means the basic teachings of the Buddha, all the dharma teachings, and so on. Mindfulness of dharmas means becoming mindful of the constituents or the basic building blocks of two aspects. The first aspect is samsara, second aspect is nirvana. The basic building blocks for samsara are, in the traditional account, the five heaps or five skandhas, means all the most basic phenomena we experience. We can say there are colors, red, orange, green, and so on. Inside these, there are many neural shades. <laughs> there are shapes, infinite numbers of names that we can give to different shapes. There's economic systems, the history of villages, towns, cities, nations. There are many, many things out of which we make other things. Anything which is a product can also be the cause for further products. We have this endless chain of cause and, and effect. Each point of that can be called a dharma, because the dharma is the building block. So our world is built up of many kinds of assumptions. So at the moment, we're in England. So that's not a very problematic statement. But what it means is that we all share an assumption. We agree that well, the place where we are is called England. It needn't necessarily be called England, because England is called by other names if you're living in other countries. But inside this language game, we agree it's England. And when we adopt that language game, it reassures us that we're a bunch of smart cookies who know what's what. We know it's England. Hooray! And it's Saturday. Oh, it's getting better. <laughs> Not demented yet. We have to be thoughtful then. This is a construct, and I am taking the construct as a given. So mindfulness of dharmas is mindfulness of the way in which a construct is taken as being self-existing. The classic uh, example for this comes from the uh, early uh, text, the Melinda Pano, the Questions of King Melinda, many of you will know it very well, where the prince uh, asked this monk to explain basic principles of Buddhism to him, and uh, the monk asked for the king's chariot to be brought out. That In those days they didn't have screws and so on, the chariot was put together with pieces of wood with little wooden wedges in to hold it in place, and he asked the king's servants to take the carry it to pieces and lay out all the pieces. There was a lot of wood and so on lying on the ground. And he says to the king, great king, where is your chariot? The king says, I don't have a chariot anymore. It's destroyed. I don't have a chariot. Then he asks the servants to put the pieces together again. They come together. There's the chariot. Oh, says the king, now I have a chariot again. So then the monk says to the king, what was added to the pieces to make a chariot. Because when the pieces of wood were there, laid out on the ground, you didn't have a chariot. What was added? Nothing substantial was added, but something was added. Concept in our head 
now we see a chariot and this chariot that we see we see as being out there but where does the chariot exist in here the chariot is in our head this is a name a shape an interpretation which we project onto the phenomena outside and because we have a shared cultural agreement that is a chariot whew, we all feel intelligent but actually we become stupid because we've agreed to imagine that something is truly existing which is not truly existing a construct has been brought into place a bit like in, in architecture if you're building a, a big doorway like in a church you set up the wooden frame and then you bring the stones into place and then there's the keystone and the keystone locks in you know it's this wedge shaped stone and when it locks in the pressure coming from both sides squeezes onto the keystone and it holds the arch in place so when we apply this concept chariot or human being all these dharmas all these assumptions all these pieces which have been aligned which have been juxtaposed in this pattern but were a bit sort of wavery it's a chariot <gasps> everything locks into shape then. and the more you use the chariot as a chariot it becomes a chariot well, I remember as a kid having a bicycle and sometimes the chain would come off the bicycle and you know, get my hands would be all covered in oil and I'd be struggling to get the chariot on I think what's this it's not a bicycle if it's a bicycle, I'd be sitting on it, riding it. And then eventually you get, the cha you get the chain back on, and the bicycle's a bicycle. But when the chain's off the bicycle, it's not a bicycle. All your mates are on their bicycle, and you're just getting covered in oil. It's that simple, isn't it? We get sick. When we get sick, we're not ourselves. Then you get better. Oh, I'm back to myself again. Here I am. Where did you go? I don't know. <laughs> this, is, this is very, very interesting. What is this missing ingredient? From the Buddhist point of view, this is an imputation. So, an imputation, by definition, is something put from the outside into something. It's, it's a projection. It's put into something, and having been put into it, it is then experienced as belonging to that thing into which it has been put. It appears inherent when it's actually contingent. Does that make sense? So that is very profound. It's also, in a sense, almost banal. But if you apply it, then you can see, moment by moment, either I'm cheating myself, by taking things to exist when they don't really exist or, and this is the more tantric point of view so it feels a bit more groovy <laughs> I am creating everything whoa I am the man <laughs> or the woman according to your gender <laughs> so who is saying that this is a Buddhist center? we are we name it people who don't know anything about Buddhism would say, I don't know what it is, some weird place. We say, no, it's not a weird place. It's a Buddhist center. And they say, oh, I didn't know. Now I know it's a Buddhist center. I'll call it a Buddhist center, though it still looks pretty weird to me. <laughs> so, observing that again and again, we are creating narratives that we believe in. We are storytellers for ourselves. This suspension of disbelief, this succumbing, this enchantment, this intoxication, mesmerizing, being bedazzled, we surrender the clarity of awareness as the price of belonging but our belonging is then a kind of imprisonment. Does that make sense? So, 
what is <coughs> the, the <coughs> excuse me the view in Sokshen is how to maintain the clarity of awareness and still participate with the full pleasure and enjoyment of life but and run these two things together so that it's not an either or because so often in Buddhism and in Hinduism and other paths, either you're a worldly person running around involved in things, or you step back and you become a spiritual person. And a mark of your spirituality is that you're not involved in things. Whereas this is saying it's not the participation that's the problem, it's participating as if everything was truly real, taking it for granted allowing yourself not to see the actual nature of what is occurring, which is like a group hallucination. We human beings in this culture at this time have these thoughts together. 200 years ago, a meeting like this would not have been possible in Macclesfield. The cultural beliefs of the time, the economic situation of the time, the class differentiation of the time, would have meant a meeting like this would be impossible. Can you imagine 200 years ago a Baptist church in Macclesfield? It would have been like this. It would not be like this at all. Not just because the Christian texts and so on would be different, but people's postures would be different. You know, they would be holding themselves in a particular way to be in the chapel together. But that shifted. So What's occurring just now among us is a construction. Due to causes and conditions, there's an interest in Buddhism in Britain. Due to other causes and conditions, this place arises in Macclesfield. Due to other causes and conditions, for some reason, we all meet here together this weekend. This is a joint creation which has no inherent substance to it. It's just a meeting and party. Our energies meet with more or less contact. For some people, what's happening here might be very uh, meaningful and useful. For other people, they're thinking, I don't really know why I'm here. This all seems a bit strange. That depends on the particular resonances we have inside ourselves. And then it dissolves, then it's gone. Who is the one who had the experience? Each of us. What is the nature of that awareness that is present now in this very moment. It's not just thoughts, it's not just stories about yourself. Before the thought, you're still here. Oh. Just, oh. Just, oh, is there just this openness, nothing at all? And then there's something. And the something arises in the nothing. Here we are. What is it? Whatever we want it to be. We are making it up. No, we're not. It's what it is. It's not. Well, if we didn't bring our cultural assumptions into this, it wouldn't exist in this way. That is to say, our participation is an act of co-creation. This is an emergent field which emerges due to the particular qualities that we have. And each person in this room will have their own unique, specific taste in their mouth. You have your experience of here. You can be sitting next to someone who's feeling, this is great. And you're thinking, what is it? The same sort of stuff is going on. But how come it's so different? Because of what we bring to it. That's our particular patterning of dharmas. So dharmas are all these possible aspects which, when they come together, create forms. And either you take the forms as real, and that's the creation of samsara, or you see the illusory, constructed nature of these forms. And with that awareness, you allow them to come and go. Dzogchen, this is called the self-liberation of all phenomena. They arise, they're here, impactful, changing, moving. And then they're gone. What is it that's changed and moved? My energy. What is it that's changing and moving it? Your energy. 
energy fields necessarily have no solid internal definition. They, are, they uh, reverberate across each other. So, <laughs> mindfulness of dharmas in the aspects of samsara, of samsara are like that. The other aspect is mindfulness of the factors of nirvana, which <coughs> in the Theravadan tradition means looking at the Four Noble Truths. So, <coughs> the path to awakening arises on the basis of understanding the First Noble Truth of suffering. Although all of us suffer and have difficulty in our lives, we understand that in different sorts of ways. Some people might think, well, it's genetic. Some people might think, well, it's just like the weather, isn't it? Life's hard. Some people might, probably through coming in contact with the Dharma, come to a point where they think, oh, yeah, there is a lot of suffering. My life is actually not very good. The, the illusions that I've been kind of keeping my chin above the water with, I don't want them anymore. But yeah, this, this life really is quite painful. Then you have the second truth, that there is an origin to this suffering. Oh. You start to, to read some dharma, you think, oh, that's right. That's what happened. When I got involved with that bloke, and it was like this and this and this, that was what was happening. That was attachment. That was delusion. That's really what happens for me. In that way, we can see I built up a particular illusion, and now I see how I built that up. Like the Buddha says in the in the in the Dhammapada, you know, the <coughs> The creator of this house is, is gone. The house is broken. The roof beams are down. The house of illusion has collapsed. I see what I do. I think I'm making a good life for myself, but I'm actually creating a prison because I'm trying to make something impermanent permanent. That's why I suffer. I don't suffer because I don't try hard enough I suffer because I try unskillfully. You can't make a silk purse out of a... <laughs> you can't make permanent liberation out of impermanent phenomena. But we try. But we try. So that's awakening on that second point. Then the third point, of course, is that there is an ending of suffering. And the ending of suffering comes if I no longer bring these constructive facts, factors together and believe in them, there will be no suffering. Because the suffering arises from the false belief in something true. That is to say, I'm trying to get the unstable to be stable. If I recognize the unstable is unstable, energetic manifestation is always changing, we have meeting and parting. I can give myself the the pain which goes with that. I you know your children go leave home or whatever and you feel sad. There's a suitable amount of pain. But if you start thinking the meaning of my life is lost, that's because there's been a false attachment. And if you have kids, they grow up and they go away. They're doing what's natural. So if you have built your life on top of your children, you're going to get upset. If you build your life up on the structure of your work, and then the boss leaves and some arsehole comes in, then you're going to be sad. Because you think, but I, I liked it the way it was. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, but you didn't have any power to control it. Yeah, but I thought, what did you think? We didn't think, you assumed. <coughs> Thinking and assuming is different. So, in that way, to awaken to the <coughs> ending of suffering is to stop wasting energy of trying to make things the case when they're not the case. And then the fourth aspect is the Eightfold Noble Path, which leads to letting go of the delusions of uh, the pathways to suffering. So, these dharmas also one can be mindful of but also mindful of them as impermanent factors, because all the good aspects of the Eightfold Noble Path, like livelihood and so on, these are all impermanent.
concentration, even, even wisdom is impermanent. Nothing is permanent. You build up a lot of experience, and then you get old and you die. Or if you live long enough, you get dementia, and you forget. So what was it all about? What was the point? Well, who is the one who gets dementia? This is going to be Dzogchen for the next 50 years. Because <laughs> it's a very central question we have to face. There's no point to have a fantasy of enlightenment is clear all the time and then we get lost. Awareness and the content of the mind are not the same. It's quite possible to be aware and confused at the same time. And we'll look at that in terms of the meditation tomorrow morning. But if you build up in your mind an image of what clarity is, if we think who does it nice sort of smiley, clear, honest, straightforward sort of a chap. That's the sort of a chap I want to be. Maybe it's not like that. Maybe the Buddha is more like one of these wild nutters with flames coming up. That is to say, when you feel confused, when you feel depressed, when you feel lonely, if you have decided these factors indicate to me something is wrong, therefore I cannot be alert, I cannot be awake, I cannot be in a state of awareness, otherwise this wouldn't be happening. You are simply telling a story to yourself. Don't tell stories, observe and do the practice again and again, be aware whatever is happening. There is no conditioned arising which can limit awareness. That is the central point of the Mahamudra and Sokshin teachings. Awareness includes everything. It cannot be caught or trapped by anything. So whatever mental state you're in, maybe sometimes you're in despair, hopelessness, dis um, um, kind of cynicism, a kind of uh, agitated excitement, whatever state it is, don't fall into it. Don't take it as real. Don't take, take it as definitive of who you are. Stay present with the one who is having the experience and observe. The experience will pass. Who is left? The one who is present with the experience. Who is that one? What color does it, do they have? What shape? And so on. We'll, we'll go into that practice in the morning. So, today we've uh, briefly covered the basics of the four foundations, both in terms of uh, applying them from the point of view of an effortful consciousness which is seeking to see what's there, but also applying the Dzogchen critique that would indicate that too much effort is also part of the problem. The heart of all of the practice is to be kind to yourself, to trust yourself, to open to yourself and through that opening to the situation. Because if you act as a policeman on top of yourself, if you're suspicious of yourself, everything will shrink. And in that shrunken state, everything you see will be diminished. The advantage of it is it gives everything a shape, a definite shape, where you think you can move it around and make things happen. But it's a very small world. And that's the world that's referred to as samsara. And Dharma practice can also lead to other forms of samsara. Mm -hmm. Giving yourself a hard time. The, the, the most basic fact, and we'll look at it tomorrow, but it's worth saying just now, you will never get enlightened. You are already enlightened. Enlightenment is part of our existence. Awake spaciousness is an aspect of ourselves. You can't make it, you can't buy it, you can't lose it. So if you say, I'm going to get it, when I'm ready, when I'm worthy, it takes a very long time. Because how could the ego be worthy of it? It's not about being worthy, it's already yours. It's already yours. So it's about observing yourself and seeing how you are and through that awakening the fantasies of the stories you have that tell you who you are.
<coughs> okay, if we begin just with some quiet focus sitting. So, focusing your attention on an external <coughs> object or on the flow of the breath. Just make the clear intention that that's the only thing you'll focus on. And whenever the mind wanders off, just gently bring it back. <coughs> in relation to Sokshin. So again, this practice we just did, a basic um, calming meditation, means I am going to, by the use of a conscious focus for my attention, I'm going to separate myself from my usual enmeshment with distraction. That is to say, I'm extricating myself from the normal pool interfusion with the various phenomena that arise. I want to stand apart from the uh, ever-changing flow of experience. In that way I seek to get some kind of space in my mind. Because when I'm caught up in stuff, when it's all very busy, there isn't much space. Some of the thoughts that arise may feel quite spacious, but because I'm in them, I don't see them in relation to anything else. So in the general Mahayana analysis, this is called the state of impure relative truth. That is to say, in relative truth, you have the situation of duality, a subject and an object which are truly separate. And it's described as impure because... The subject takes itself as strongly real, takes the object as strongly real, and moves towards the object and towards itself through the five poisons. <coughs> Stupidity or assumption, desire, attachment, anger, aversion, pride and jealousy, and all the other things that come out from that. That is to say, one is always looking through colored glasses. There's always some kind of coloration, some kind of emotional, affective, uh, you could say enrichment or distortion to what's going on. It's very difficult for us to see a situation without immediately having an opinion, a response. And that response comes to be <coughs> the main uh, sense of the situation that we take away with us. So, what we're doing, <coughs> in a sense, is learning how to see, learning how to listen, learning how to taste, learning how to touch, without filling that space with our habitual attitudes. So that's why that sort of calming practice is very important. It's providing a concentration which is simple and straightforward. It doesn't have any agenda, and it's not made better by any form of passion or emotional enrichment. Don't you? You, can't, you don't concentrate better if you're angry or if you are sad or if you are uh, desireful. You may feel that you're concentrating more because you may have a fixation on the object of desire or on the object of your rage. If you're really pissed off with something, there's a kind of tunnel vision, and you really kind of know exactly what's what about the person or the situation you're irritated by. But that's very different from a calm, clear concentration. Because with concentration, the object is allowed to reveal itself. Whereas when you're focusing on something with an affect of arousal, you put a projections onto it. You think you're seeing it clearly, but actually you're creating it out of your projections, out of what you're imputing to be the case for the object. The more we calm the mind and find ourselves less automatically caught up in whatever's arising, we start to be a bit more spacious. We can see more clearly. Uh, we are both separated from what is going on and very connected with what is going on. 
because our real connection begins with perspective. We have to be separated in order to see. You don't see infusion, and you also don't see in avoidance. So there's, when we see clearly, we have the, the safety of not being under attack, because what we're seeing is apart from us. It's not getting to us, it's not controlling us, it's not overwhelming us, it's, this is what's there. And it's there, it's not here, as it were. So that separation allows, oh yeah, now what is this? But the very act of inquiring, what is this, is immediately connected with it. So as we touched on yesterday, that's <clears throat> the union of wisdom and compassion. Wisdom is seeing things as they are, in their own place, without distortion. And compassion is the unbroken connection with whatever is arising. Sometimes we see compassion as a form of pity, of wanting to take care of people. But <clears throat> in order to take care of someone, one has to see what is their actual situation. What is it that ails that person? Everybody can tell lots of stories of grief. Um, we all have lots of hassles and troubles in our lives. But from a Buddhist point of view, these are not the real thing. These are the kind of bubbles, the froth on the surface. These are momentary disturbances generated by deeper structural faults. What really ails us is not being at peace in ourselves, and through that not recognizing who we really are. So the, in, in being alienated from ourselves, we live as refugees. And refugees have a hard time all over the world. You just open the newspapers, you see, whoa, I wouldn't like to be a refugee. But we are refugees. And that, when you're a refugee, you can't settle in yourself. You're always wondering what's going to happen now. You don't have a stable base. You don't have an entitlement. You don't have a passport. And it's that very homelessness, which is the meaning in, in the idea that we wander in samsara. The ordinary Tibetan word for sentient beings is drawa, somebody who's moving or going. Because we're always chasing after one thing or another, hoping that the objects that we find will provide a real refuge or a real home for us. But of course they arise and then they pass. We think we've found something safe and secure and then something shifts and it's gone. And that's always what seems to be the case. It's very difficult to find anything safe and secure. <coughs> so in the what's called the pure relative truth, there's still the sense that I am here as a subject experiencing objects, <coughs> but these objects now are more simple because I'm not telling them what they are. I'm not seeing them mediated through my need, my reaction in terms of gain or loss. Gain what's my desire, what can I appropriate here, or loss, how terrifying or frightening are they, could they remove some security or certainty from me, and so bringing up aversion. <coughs> the optimal possibility of this is to have space in our mind. We become relaxed and spacious. <coughs> And this is the general path of all the Mahayana teachings and a great deal of Tantra. Dzogchen, a word which simply means the great perfection or the natural perfection, is a view and a practice in the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. It's also in some other traditions. And it is concerned not with getting space in mind, but with recognizing the mind in space. That is to say, spaciousness comes first. Spaciousness is the gr primordial ground, an openness, an indeterminability, an ungraspability at the very core of our identity. And from this uh, openness, there arises what we take to be our mind. That is to say, we become aware of the spaciousness itself. So in the traditional example, in the infinity of the sky, there is the sun. 
and the sun is there blazing out. So the sun is like awareness. It radiates and illuminates all that's around, but the sun is located in space. Because if we're trying to get space inside ourselves, it's as if we're a balloon. And the, the more you blow up the balloon, the more kind of it gets bigger and bigger, and it seems to have this space inside it, but it's encapsulated in a skin bag. It, it's sealed. The air inside the balloon is not different from the air outside the balloon, but this thin rubber membrane creates the appearance of a separation. So as long as we are fundamentally committed to being an individual, no matter what we develop, it, it's very difficult to escape the domain of appropriation. This is my experience. I'm quite good at this. I have realized this. The self-referential, self-reflexive movement that takes even a very open experience somehow back to what seems to be an enduring, ongoing central point of reference becomes a limitation even in the midst of opening. So, the path of Sokshen is about non-appropriation. It's about letting be, just trusting what's there. Trusting whatever comes, comes. Not trying to interfere with events too much, because actually all our interference is simply a form of activity which creates new problems. So, the government's spending a lot of money to interfere with an economic crisis. That interference arose as a necessity due to a crisis, and the crisis rose from a kind of interference. So interference leads to interference, leads to interference, and what joins each level of interference is a crisis. Every time we try to do something, we make things better, and we make them worse. If we make them better in the short term, you can be pretty sure we'll make them worse in the long term. So, big projects in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and later on in China, was building big dams on rivers. We have an irrigation problem, we need to uh, get the water and send it out in pipes in the right direction, so we'll build a big dam. Build a big dam, get a lot of silt, big dam doesn't work. But the fish have died and so on. Many tragedies occurred in America, in Aswan Dam and so on, because of over control. We know from the Stalinist period, farming, centralization and so on. It's not that people have necessarily a bad intention, but as long as we are encapsulated in our little bag, we have our point of view, our frame of reference. We see what we can see from where we are. And if we think that that is a total vision, if we think we're getting the whole shebang, we are very, very deluded. So, <coughs> part of the, the view in Sokshen is less activity and more openness. The more we open, the more we see the complexity, and then we work with the complexity, not through the paradigm of control and power, but through minimal joining or participation moment by moment. Grand plans tend to be disastrous because they are always blind. You read the history of the First World War and uh, the, the various pushes that were uh, taken up on the Western Front, and you weep. You see these 10,000 young men, 50,000 young men. Someone blows a whistle, and people are getting up and walking into this hail of machine gun bullets. Why? Because somebody had a grand plan. And the person who has the grand plan is not the person who's walking into the machine gun bullets. The person who has the grand plan for collectivization of farms on the Russian steppes is sitting in the Kremlin with quite a full belly. Mao Zedong's grand plans had the holy leader sitting in Beijing surrounded with plenty of food and young girls. 
this is what we have to be aware of, that the one who manifests the grand plan and the one who pays the price are not the same. This is not just in politics, it's inside ourselves. Because we are not one thing. We are a polyphonic universe, each of us. We have many, many different voices, many different attitudes, impulses, many different positions or facets. And when we occupy one of these positions, that seems to be the truth. When we're angry, that's the world is revealed through anger. When we feel tired, we see the world in terms of tiredness. Somebody phones you and invites you to do something, and if you're tired, you don't want to go. If you were not tired, you'd really want to go, and you'd be excited. But the phone call comes through to the one who's tired. And you say, no, no, I'm not really in the mood. Oh, but you like it. You really love it. Not today. And then later you think, oh, God, why didn't I go? Now, the one that's regretting not going is not the one that's tired. <laughs> so that's what we experience again and again. Or maybe you have a fight with a partner or something, and afterwards you think, why did I say that? Well, you said it because the one who said it is not the one who regrets it. That's why we are polyphonic. We are full of different voices. These voices are not conscious and intentional. They're constellated in the moment of interaction. That is to say, we are ceaselessly participative, but our participation is always a fragment. Like we began yesterday looking at the dismembering. If you like, if you like we are dismembered. And until we can remember or keep an eye on or be aware of all our different members or aspects, all that we're doing when we participate in the world is bringing one bit out and bringing others back in. Every revealing is a concealing. Every showing of one bit of us is hiding of the other bits of us. Which is why when we are caught up in samsara, that is to say when we are caught up in duality, there is a kind of clarity that goes with a commitment to a position. Now I know what I'm on about. Yes, I know what I really want. And in the intensity of the arousal of that, we don't recognize that's just today's point of view. It's just today's point of view. It's going to change. The old saying is, a week's a long time in politics. Well, an hour's a long time in being yourself. How reliable are you? Maybe every five <laughs> minutes you've changed. Maybe even every one minute. That's an amazing thing. Now, if you're committed with the idea to the idea, I should be reliable, I should know who I am, you're going to be very disturbed to know that you are not so reliable. So what's the best way of dealing with being disturbed? Deceit. <laughs> Denial. So we pretend. We pretend to be more reliable than we are. And if we get away with it, pretty good. <laughs> cheating other people, cheating ourselves. I'm a regular guy. Hmm. You're pretty regular too. Hmm. This is not true. But this is the social convention. This is the way that we move. We attempt to stay in role. We attempt to, attempt to stay on track. All of which involves an editing and a construction of our presentational self. Hmm? Modern sociologists and anthropologists have written a lot about this, about the nature of narrative and construction of social identity. But we don't need to read books to understand it, we just need to observe ourselves. The fact that we want people to like us, therefore we do as consumerism would recommend, give the people what they want. We try to be what the other wants. And because we have many different aspects, we can very often do that. But what do we want? So then we have a tension between being true to myself and fitting in or adapting. And that tension can become very wearing. Especially because if I think what other people want or require of me, is not what I want, it's easy to draw the conclusion, what I want is wrong. 
if other people are the validators of my value and I feel false in pleasing them or fitting in, that's a sign that I must be full of shit. So all the more reason to seal myself over, to not look at who I am, and to keep the facade going. That's very difficult. You know, if, if other people knew who I was, what would they think? But, as Robbie Burns said, the greatest gift the Lord could give us to see ourselves as others see us. The fact is, other people do see us. It's not that we're pulling the wool over their eyes. We're pulling the wool over our eyes. <laughs> because we actually reveal ourselves quite a lot. <clears throat> so part of the function of meditation is to just provide a space in which you can see what's going on. And in Dzogchen meditation, <clears throat> the basic principle is we just open and relax and stay present with whatever is occurring. All that is occurring is both me and not me. It's me in that it is my world. This is my experience. It may not be shared by anyone else, but is what's happening for me. It's not me in the sense that the one who is having the experience is always separated from the experience itself. So Mahayana writings can write a lot about the difference between mind and the content of the mind. Sem dang sem jung. Sem jung means what is arising or coming up inside your mind, and then there's the mind itself. So there's the knower and the known. But what we usually do is we fuse with what is arising for us. We take our experience to be personal. That very gesture of appropriation means that there is a sight from which the appropriation is going out. Oh my God, I don't want to be like that. So some thoughts are risen in our head, that. And we feel that is defining me, because it wouldn't be in my head unless it was mine. Two things are happening. The thought itself is being objectified and intensified. It's very strongly real. And the one who is taken to be the experiencer of the thought, I, is then seen also to be small and truly real. And so I can feel overwhelmed by my own thoughts. Most of us sitting here, with a little bit of sun streaming in the window, could remember some incident from our childhood when we felt very shamed. And if we allowed ourselves to really go into that memory, we would feel very odd. We would feel bad. Do you think that's true? Yeah. So, <clears throat> what happens when you get shamed is you become small. Shame is, to, is the experience of being cut off from free participation in the environment. Somebody uh, encounters you very powerfully, they uh, direct their attention and their energy to you to say how you are, and especially what you are, who you are, is bad. And when that comes right into us, we implode. These imploded states <coughs> affirm the possibility of defining who we are. That is to say, we exist as a thing. <coughs> In my hand I have a watch. A watch is a thing. We can know about a watch. You can turn a watch around and you can put it down. It doesn't have any legs on it. It won't walk away. It's fairly reliable and predictable, so to a certain extent you can know it. Of course, I will never know the watch the way a watchmaker will know it. If I open the back of the watch, I'm bewildered. If a watchmaker opens the back of the watch, they just know what it is. So, for me, the, there's a lot in the watch which can't reveal itself to me because I lack the interpretive structures to make sense of it. Now, people are much, much more complicated. A watch may well have moving parts, but it seems to have some fairly stable parts as well. The question for us is, do we have any stable parts? What have we got? We've got bodies, but they seem to bop about a lot. Blood's always pumping, air's going in and out. 
endocrine systems moving, hormones flushing here, there, and everywhere. That's continuous. There's just a flow of stuff. There aren't stable things. Even bones are not particularly stable because they're actually processes. Thoughts are clearly not very stable. Neither are feelings nor sensations. When we scan our experience, as many of you do in different kinds of meditation, you see there's nothing solid there. What we encounter is movement, a movement which is revealed to someone. And this is the central question always. Who is the owner of experience, or who is the experiencer of experience? Because if we don't know that, then when we talk about what's happening to me, or how I feel, no matter how clear most of the sentence is, no, much, no matter how much sense it makes to other people and to ourselves, there is a kind of mystery embedded in it, which is I. I feel happy. What does that mean? There's some happiness around. Who is the one who is feeling it? That is taken for granted. The taking for granted of the enduring stability and knownness of the first person singular is the basis of ignorance. That is to say, we assume that I is a done deal, that this felt sense of my own individual existence is self-explanatory. And therefore, we don't examine it. And so it remains <coughs> as something which is uh, truly uh, revealing, but it's also concealing. Again, we could use the image of a mirror in a slightly different way. <coughs> when you look in a mirror, you see reflections you don't see the mirror itself. You cannot see the mirror because it reveals itself through reflections and the reflection is always other than the mirror. When we say, I am tired, I is like the mirror. It is a kind of, what should we say, opaque clarity. If I say I am tired, that's easily comprehensible. So it looks very clear and illuminating bit of information, I'm tired. But the I, which seems to be part of the clarity, you can't find out what it is. Who is tired? Well, personally, I'm a bit tired, but I'm not completely tired. So, which bit of me is tired? How would I know? When you get an advent calendar, you get all these little doors you can open. So maybe we could open little doors in ourselves to check out which bit is tired. But it's not like that, because it sort of moves through, and it's, sometimes it seems more there, and then it sort of vanishes. And then, God, like, God, I really am tired. Oh, well, actually. And it's this w wispy kind of morning mist experience, which we are. Ungraspable, and yet somehow palpable. It seems to kind of, when you go for it, it seems to be there. You touch something, but when you try to get it, you can't get it. That seemed to be with your experience. So, in really inquiring into who is the one who is having the experience, that is the absolute center of the practice. Otherwise, we are eternally condemned simply to be in stories about ourselves and stories about other people. And then when we read in the Buddhist text, you know, all phenomena, including all sentient beings, are devoid of inherent self-existence, well, that's just a lot of words. Because we are reading that sentence thinking, God, I've been trying to understand that for years. Now I understand. And in that moment, the door of hell opens. You know, how could you understand it? The one who has understand, understood it has taken the dagger of clarity and stuck it through their eye. Because it's appropriated. As soon as we've got it, it's got us. Whatever you get turns your hand into a, a grasping fist. And then you've, you've lost your freedom. So gaining is losing. And this is the particular discourse of the ego. 
In, in Tibetan, they talk of dag sin. Dag means eye, jin means to hold or to grasp. And when we get the world, when we make sense of something, we become defined by it. You know, if you do a training, while you're doing that training, <coughs> you have a kind of potential. As soon as you do your training and finish your training, you now are whatever you've trained at. Which is great. Now I'm a whatever it is. I'm an acupuncturist. For the rest of my life, I'm going to be sticking needles in people's <laughs> bums. <laughs> so the doorway to freedom is now a prison. Be careful what you ask for. Hmm? Because if you become something, is it really what you want? Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. <laughs> I don't know what we really want. Again, it seemed a good idea at the time. It's not just the Nazis who were into a final solution. The ego is always looking for a final solution. We want to get there. We want the one true solution. Now I am saved. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior? Yes. Now you are saved. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, that would be great, wouldn't it? And then the next day, life's not so good. Come back, Billy Graham. That, that's the problem, isn't it? That's what Maslow talks of as a peak experience. You know? <gasps> got to the top of the mountain. It's beautiful. But there's no food. It's very cold. And the air is very thin. So I think I'll go home again. So you can't stay up there. And that's, that's the nature of impermanence. Experience follows experience follows experience. When you get somewhere, it's just the beginning of leaving that place. Now, all of this is central to understanding <coughs> the view of Sokshin, which is the mind itself is pure from the very beginning. That is to say, each of us here and now, in our own little body, with all our thoughts and memories and fantasies and so on, the exquisitely subtle presence of just being ourselves prior to thought, sensation, and so on. This is pure. That is to say, it has no content. Because it has no content, it can have all content. That is to say, we can be many, many different things. And each of us are. Each person here has many different kinds of conversations, shows many different appearances to family members, children, parents, friends, lovers, people in shops, you know, people, colleagues, and so on. We have many, many different interactions. And internally in ourselves, in the course of a day, all sorts of feelings and sensations arise. It is because we are indeterminate, because you can't define who you are, that you can be all things. So samsara is the anxious desire to define your own existence. I want to know who I am. I am this. I am this. I am that. And, and what makes samsara different from nirvana, according to the Buddhist tradition, is that in samsara, each of these momentary solutions instead of being seen as a gesture of interaction, a communication in the ongoing flow of communication, is taken as definitive. So, I, if, we, if you looked at the time perspective, that's the general understanding of Buddhism, we have many, many different lifetimes. So I can say, I am a man. But again, that has to have a comma at the end of it. I am a man in this life. In another life, I could be a frog or a dog. Possible. <laughs> so, what I take to be this situation is relative. That is to say, it is contingent, or it's dependent, and co arising. <coughs> Due to causes and circumstances, I am alive in this form. There is no inherent truth or definition in this, because due to factors it can change. 
And that's true of all the factors of our existence. With uh, the economic downturn, many people have lost their jobs. They, there was nothing in what they were doing that was bad or wrong. Actions from people many thousands of miles away, behavior which the people these thousand miles away thought was okay and had no sense of distant consequences, these actions cause redundancies. The fact that China wants to develop its uh, economic structure and have a lot of low-priced exports means that many factories in the Midlands here went, went bankrupt because they couldn't face the competition. In the Heritage Museum, they had a sign up <laughs> saying how when uh, the uh, import restrictions on silk from France were, were lifted, lots of the mills went bankrupt. So some, some law made in London impacts what's happening in France, and people in Macclesfield became unemployed. France and London, you could say, don't have all that much to do with Macclesfield, but of course they do. So somebody living their life as a weaver concerned with their daily things, with their sense of their world, suddenly finds that there's a wind blowing from very, very far away, and it topples this little structure that they're in. They didn't see it coming. How could they? Because on one level, it had nothing to do with them. And that's the very interesting thing, isn't it? We feel that there's so much in the world that has nothing to do with us, because we have a little shape that we live in, my little world. I have my little house, my little ponies, I've got my Barbies, I move them around, I do their hair, I put them up in a row, and we have a picnic, and then we have Christmas, and we have a birthday party. So I have now a job, and I've got to pay my mortgage, I've got the shops, and maybe I've got a special friend. <laughs> and then a big wind blows. Somebody dies, or you go to the doctor and they say, uh-uh, it's bad news, and the whole thing shifts. This is, this is the problem of the clarity of the ego, is that it's always trying to stabilize a situation and, and turn the world into a kind of chess game, as if we knew all the pieces on the board. And so we're moving these things up around. If I do that and that and that and that, then I'll know where I am. All these pensioners now endlessly opening up the newspaper or going on the internet to find out which bank's giving them a better rate of interest and moving their money around. You know, this kind of anxious, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then suddenly the government changes this, so they put that. Oh, I didn't know. I wouldn't have done that. Just tie your money up for five years. But if I put it in for five years, I get four and a half percent. But if I put it in for three years, I get three and a half percent. Now, how can I know in three years' time what the economy will be? People are doing their heads in with this kind of thing. Lots of anxiety and worry. How can I know what will happen? Only if I know what will happen will I be safe. Well, sweetie, you don't know what will happen. You're not safe. But I want to be safe. You mean I spent my whole life working in the post office to end up unsafe? People, you, know, you can see this anger and rage and confusion that's around. And what Buddhism would say is this is just a whole paradigm error that samsara is a paradigm, a, a, a kind of world view within which there is a lot of structural faulting which is invisible. And because we don't see the structural faults, we interpret the faults as being something to do with ourselves, and then we try harder to fix them. But if the faults are structural, they're beyond our capacity. And if we wake up to that, then we can often feel demoralized and hopeless. Oh, what's the point? I've done my best. It hasn't worked out. What should I do? You can see that in, in Britain. There's a whole depressive energy that's everywhere. It's just sort of, oh, it's the election coming. Who the hell would you vote for? It's just, oh, sort of despair. And Buddhism is saying, all of this distress comes from looking in the wrong place. Who is the one who is having the experience? Rather than being always thinking about what is the, the, the content of my experience and how can I improve the content, that is to say having a sort of object fixation 
looking out and moving things about, we relax and explore who is the experiencer themselves. Am I truly a construct? Most modern psychological ideas have a, a notion of the baby uh, coming into the world as a potential which uh, takes on its various shapes and attitudes and so on on the basis of experience. That is to say, we are constructed out of experience. And on the level of the personality, I think that's true. But are we simply our personality? Our personality is a kind of repertoire of moods, attitudes, habits. That is to say, these are ongoing uh, patterns, procedures, which are evoked by certain circumstances. From the point of view of observing ourselves, from the point of view uh, of the, the, the clarity that comes from getting our own number, when I see what I'm up to, and I still do that, we start to see there are two aspects to me. I am both my procedural identity, like <sighs> if I open a bottle of wine, I better finish it. <laughs> it's ridiculous, you know. I mean, that's what bottles of wine are for. If I take one slice out of the cake, before it looked very beautiful. It was a complete circle. Now taking a slice out of it, it looks a bit ugly. I'll just improve the shape a bit. <laughs> In that way, people have various kind of procedures where they feel driven to go on with something, even if they think they shouldn't go on with it. And so we see what we're up to, but we can't quite stop it. And in that way, our very consciousness is persecutory to ourselves. Because we can see, but we, we don't seem to be able to act. It's as if the drive or the habit or the impulse is driving us into things where we suffer. No, as I was suggesting earlier, that's because the drive, as it were, is one aspect and the one who feels guilty and bad afterwards is another aspect. And these aspects, if they don't speak to each other, create a kind of uh, confusion. For example, there you can see uh, a statue of the Buddha, blue in color, medicine Buddha, and he's surrounded by other Buddhas. All the Buddhas <coughs> have the same nature, but they show different forms to different circumstances. Just as Padmasambhava has eight different forms, in fact, hundreds of thousands of different forms, we also have these many, many different forms. Which is our real form? No form is our real form. There isn't, it's not that, you know, as a, some psychologists uh, like Winnicott have said that you have a false self and a true self that somewhere deep inside us is our authentic being and due to various compromises we've made with the world we've become strangers to ourselves we've become alienated from who we really are and therefore if we give up that alienation we'll return to being authentic if I'm true to myself, that would be beautiful. You know, Polonius says to son Laertes, to thine own self be true. This above all things, to thine own self be true. And if you can do that, you'll never be false to anyone else. What I was reading recently in a commentary on that little bit of Shakespeare is, he is being ironic. But when I learned it at school, teachers giving you a little moral lesson. This is very important. Mm -hmm. Be true to yourself. Well, Shakespeare was a smart cookie. Smarter than my teacher anyway. <laughs> it's ironic. How could you be true to yourself, given that our life is circumstantial? That doesn't mean that there are no ethics. It means if I get into the blinkers of taking this situation as too strongly real, as being all there is, I may feel that I am being authentic, but I am blind. And in, in Sokshen, the main focus is on relaxation, opening, and being aware of what is there in its richness and complexity, 
and having minimal intervention, it's not a path of mastery, it's not a heroic path. Many of the tantric paths are truly heroic. You become a great being who can save the world and kick the ass of all the demons and so on. But Sokshen is not like that. Because to be a hero is to have a particular kind of agency. You can't be a hero unless you have a clear task. But what is the clear task? The clear task is to stay present. Staying present doesn't involve any big, big demons. Staying present simply involves relaxing and opening, relaxing and opening. When Jason goes in search of the Argonauts, he doesn't come up to see this incredible multi-headed <sighs> snake. <sighs> I'll just relax and open. <laughs> he just don't do that. He's got his shield, blind attack, <laughs> cut all the heads off. Aha. That is agency. I did this. Then the bards could write a story about it. So we have in the Icelandic stories as well, isn't it? We have it in Beowulf and so on. It's like the great hero does something, they encounter a demon. A lot of Tantra is established in that sort of discourse. And Sokshen, relax and open. So we do a little bit of meditation practice and then have a break. This practice is very simple. In order to do it, we, just, we sit comfortably. Central point is the mind is pure. If something is pure, it's undefiled. That is to say, when the reflection arises in the mirror, the mirror is not improved or destroyed in itself by the quality of the reflection. Whatever thoughts, feelings, and sensations arise, whatever actions you've done in your life, good actions or bad actions, none of these have improved the basic spaciousness of the mind. Every action, thought, and sensation is energy. It's a movement of the mind. The movements of the mind influence other movements of the mind. They don't influence or change the mind itself. With this understanding, we relax simply our attention out of the domain of energetic movement, which is what we're always caught up in, and just rest in the open mirror-like awareness within which and through which all movement is occurring. Movement which seems like subject, movement which seems like object. And we do this very simply by <coughs> imagining uh, in the space in front of us, a white letter R, you can do it as a capital A or as a Tibetan letter A, if you know what that is. The, this uh, R represents emptiness or the spaciousness of all things. And when we recite this sound of R three times, we relax our fixations on our sensations and so on and simply rest in the openness. And then, in sitting there, whatever arises, whatever comes, just let it be there. It's just like a reflection. It won't benefit you, and it won't harm you. So there's no need to react to it. Whatever comes, comes. Whatever goes, goes. Not trying to hang on to thoughts that seem uh, useful or beneficial or increasing of who we are not trying to push away thoughts that seem negative or demeaning to the felt sense that we have of who we are, because who we are, who we take ourselves to be, is simply an energetic construction. It's just a sand castle. Out of the infinite sand of the beach, we construct together particular shapes of the factors of our history and the things that have happened to us, and then the wave comes and washes the sandcastle back into the sand. All that we take ourselves to be 
is part of the world. We, like a magpie, we've taken this, this is my, this is my family, this is what I do, this is what I love, this is what I hate. These are simply movements of energy. So, not identifying with subject thoughts, not identifying with object situations, allow subject and object to move freely as energetic flow. So we try this for a while. <coughs> First of all, we're seeing this R. It represents the spaciousness of the mind of all the Buddhas. As we recite the R, we integrate with this presence of all the teachers, of all the Buddhas. And at the ending of the R, the, the, the sounding of the R, we just release the fixation on the letter, it dissolves in space, and we let our gaze rest in the open space in front of us. As you move, if you can, just keep the sense of the movement as movement occurring in space. If you're talking, sounds going out of you and into you through space. Okay, maybe 15 minutes, bro. So, in, in terms of mindfulness in Sokshen, what one is... Uh, Recollecting or remembering. James. Oh, you mean the <laughs> Yes, it's, it's the microphone. <laughs> there we go. Almost time to go home. <laughs> so, here, what uh, what the recollection is of is the integration of the ground and whatever is arising or the integration of the mirror and the reflection. From this point of view, what we mean by samsara, or limited existence, is the forgetfulness which separates us from the ground of our own being and has us then wandering in the maze of thoughts and feelings and so on that arise. So, one's not trying to remember a particular thing to call back to mind some specific focus but rather, moment by moment, to experience whatever is arising as inseparable from it, the open ground. So, when we relax and open, very quickly, thoughts and feelings arise. When we get caught up in these thoughts and feelings, we forget that there was that openness. And so the ongoing work is to bring the, <coughs> excuse me, the experience of the openness and the experience of the arising into the same moment, that they are inseparable. In a very similar way to what we experience psychologically. Because we all have <coughs> different aspects to our personality, we have many different moves that we can make. Sometimes we get caught up in a particular aspect, we could call it a self-state or sub-personality. And when we are in that, it is as if that is the whole world. So you, you get very angry and upset for a while, or you become very anxious, or you become depressed. That seems to be the limit of your existence. When you're in that, you can't see other aspects of yourself outside. Other people may be able to see that, which is why staying in communication with other people is important. But when you're in it, that's all you've got. And you see that most readily with small children. When they lose it, they've really lost it. They can't come back. They can't, as we say, self-soothe. 
they can't settle themselves back into the more spacious, wider aspect of themselves. So what is, on the level of ordinary personality, what is that lostness? Where do you go when you lose it? Of course, you're still here. Walking about in your body, but you're lost in a familiar place. You are where you've always been, but you've fallen asleep into something which is within the ordinary domain. Is that language making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I don't know, say you had a, an exam coming or an interview coming, you might find yourself becoming increasingly anxious. And you, your thoughts start to turn around this uh, moment that lies ahead of you. You become preoccupied by it. So, if you're preoccupied with these concerns, there isn't then space to be in touch with other aspects. The world narrows down. Then, it's very helpful, you talk to someone else and they remind you of who you are. And through their reminding, you recollect yourself. So, do you, if you are in your small self, do you collect all the other bits into the small bit? Or, through their reminding, have you been displaced from that small aspect of yourself into a wider aspect of yourself, which then has the capacity to integrate? Okay, that's a very important question if you work with people at all. If you're a school teacher or a therapist or you work in a bank, when people are in a small state, if you speak to the small state and ask the small state to be big, that will not be helpful. But that happens a lot. I remember that a lot in my childhood. When you get a bit out of it, some big person keeps whacking on this small bit of you that you're trapped in. And then, of course, the more they do that, the more you implode. It's about bridging out, helping the person to come back to themselves. It's fascinating how we use language in that way. Where do you come back from? They have been in a part of themselves which appeared to be the whole of themselves but was not really themselves, so they come back to themselves from that. Hmm? You come back to yourself from yourself. Because the self aspect is part of yourself but not the whole of yourself. And when you come back, you think, what was that all about? And the reason it's often disturbing is because the encapsulation of an aspect of yourself has a logic which cannot really be understood by the bit of oneself which is able to reflect. So in ordinary language you might say our impulsive aspects and our reflective aspects don't have much in common. So, when, when people become disturbed and they cut themselves or they take an overdose, very often alcohol is involved. And one of the, the things that alcohol does is it provides a kind of clutch that changes the gearing. So, you're in a mood and you think, I need a drink. Why do you need a drink? Because it will make me feel different. So, it's just like a clutch. It unlocks the thing you're spinning in and allows you to get into another gearing. Does that seem to fit with experience? Now. <laughs> You're ready for one now. <laughs> and, and of course that gearing can go up or down. Sometimes a drink can make someone more open, more gregarious, and they come back to themselves, or it can take them into a narrow place, isn't it? So usually, a couple of drinks will be, have their antidepressant, uh, the depressive function, which will then uh, lead to more, it's depressing the anxiety, so it leads to more connection. But if you keep drinking, you might become a bit maudlin and, and go back into a state. Observing that in oneself in the daily course of life is very, very important. Because what we do in Sokshen meditation is not all that different. It's on a different level, if you like, but the principles are the same. Optimal integration is 
from through relaxed spaciousness. The more we relax, the more all the aspects of ourselves can be allowed and tolerated, and thereby they move freely together. And through that communication, they act as a kind of balancing. Because a central, uh, there are two main aspects in suction. The first is concerned with primordial purity, with the natural purity of the mind. That is to say, it has no fixed content, it's not limited in any way, <coughs> it's not uh, defined by anything that's arising. So in that brief bit of meditation we're doing, you start to have the sense of how that can be. That if you keep releasing and letting go of whatever's arising, you start to see that when you grasp at something and it seems real, the next moment it's gone. The next moment it's gone. These moments <coughs> of arising <coughs> are like the particles of sand. And if you don't release them, you gather them together and you build your sand castle of the self. And then some event comes and washes it away, and then you're scrabbling around, getting other little moments and building up another sandcastle and another sandcastle. If we just allow them to go, we start to see awareness is unchanging, experience is always changing. The one who is aware of the experience is always there, like the mirror. And the flow of experience is just like the reflections. It's always changing. You cannot stabilize experience. So you start to let experience go. And this opens up <coughs> the second aspect of Sokshen, which is uh, spontaneity. That is to say, we allow things to be as they are. We find our participation arising just through being relaxed and open. The worry, will I get it right, wouldn't occur, because the one who is acting is not an individual self. There's nothing to prepare for in a precise way. It emerges and arises through being in the situation. So that <clears throat> our energy arises as subject and object. Here we are in this room with the awareness of our embodied being, which is inseparable from our sense of the perceptual field. Subject and object are arising together. We're never just in our own little subjectivity. These are modes of arising, ever-changing. How will we be? When we talk to different people in the break, we talk in different ways. People have different concerns. Some people are a bit in themselves. Some people are tentative and shy. Some people are more relaxed and open. And so, <clears throat> if we relax and open, we can just be in that situation. And that's what we're doing. A mutual adaption is going on all the time. That's the nature of spontaneity. That by not over-determining a situation, by not commencing with constructs and intentions, something I prepared earlier, we trust the immediacy of the connectivity will give rise to what is there. That's very different, because then you trust. It's not about trusting yourself. Because trusting yourself is a, is a very dangerous little door, because it can lead to a sort of smugness or blindness and a whole new set of assumptions. It's just trusting. Just trusting. And of course, if you trust and you're present, you're trusting with your eyes open. It's not like going to the going to the baths and going up onto the high jump, and then getting ready to dive and looking and think, oh well, I'll, I'll, I think I'll just jump. So you cover your eyes and you're like, I don't want to see what's happening. This is about seeing what's happening, but seeing it not as an an other coming at me. I would imagine. Each of us, in our different ways, can suffer from some kind of social anxiety. Most of the time, but you know, when we become adults and our lives are a bit sorted, we, we find, we create a world for ourselves where most of what we encounter is manageable. But every now and then, we have to go into another social situation and we don't know how to do it. And we find ourselves feeling a bit kind of diminished or troubled. 
that's because we start to think about the situation. Think about what will they think of me? Will I get it right? How do I do that? Now, actually, we've done, as it were, we've responded in similar ways in many situations before. But something happens in our thinking that extrapolates us from the situation. We alienate ourselves, we start thinking about it, and it all becomes a bit solid and concrete and real, and then that increases the anxiety. Would that seem to be right? Well, this is exactly what, what we're dealing with here. That ignorance is alienation. Ignorance is ignoring the fact of primordial integration. That from the very beginning, everything has been perfect. Everything has been integrated in the ground of becoming. And when we don't recognize that, then we're stuck with a lot of stuff. What is all this? There's a lot of it about. Well, what is it? So then we start naming it and trying to work out what it is. And then we, through that skill, we develop a certain mastery. We think, hmm, yeah, I know how to do this. I know how to have a life. And inside that, there's a kind of complacency. So there's these three stagings. One is losing it, ignoring what's actually the case. The second is the elaboration of interpretations. And then the third level is believing that one's interpretations are real and acting inside that little world, which runs for a while and then something whacks it. And then we get all very upset and have to rebuild our world and rebuild our world. Integration in Sokshen is <coughs> to keep relaxing into space, seeing everything arising from the same ground, if you like, like a sort of hologram. It's not a it's not flat like the surface of a mirror. Here we are in three-dimensional space. Each person in the room is an illusion. If you take the illusion as real, that's a delusion. If you recognize the illusory nature of your delusion, you awaken to the reality of the situation, which is that it's an illusion. It's just like that. Taking things which are not strongly real to be strongly real is deluded. If you're watching the television and somebody's speaking on the television and you start thinking they're speaking to you, we say that's a psychotic delusion. It's an idea of reference that has got nothing to do with you. They're just blethering away in their soap opera, but they're giving now they're giving you a message. So that's a delusion. But if you're watching the telly, everything on it is an illusion. So in a similar way, things arise like the reflection of the moon on water, like a rainbow, like a mirage. They are there, but ungraspable. When we seek to grasp them, we create something else. We create the delusion of a solid sense of inherent reality in what we perceive. And that's what samsara means. It's a reification, a solidification, which then has us bumping into situations. If you have a big jigsaw puzzle, there are lots of pieces. And sometimes it's quite difficult to get all the pieces to fit, because each piece in a jigsaw has a particular shape. And it's only going to fit in its right place. It won't fit anywhere else. That's a problem, unless you like jigsaw puzzles. If you imagine your life in samsara as an infinite, endless jigsaw puzzle, that the more you have your particular shape, you have to desperately find other pieces that will fit with you. You meet someone, you think, oh, this will be nice, and you seem to fit for a bit, and then suddenly they're tearing a bit of your edge off to say, you don't fit me. <laughs> So, when we start to see that everything's an illusion, you get the lack of, you get less concretization, and therefore there's more flexibility. That is to say, the invitation that the world ceaselessly makes to us to be flexible, to compromise, and to adapt, is not an insult and not an attack. It's actually quite nice to move.
is good for your health. It's good physically and it's good mentally. But the ego construes the situation as one of definition and defense. And so we go for power and control. But that's very difficult to achieve because the interactive field is so complicated. So, from the point of view of Sokshen, the most important thing is to relax, to trust, to open, and to practice quietly, just not for very long, you can practice five minutes at a time, ten minutes at a time, just experiencing the arising and passing of phenomena. Not from the point of view of, I am observing this, but relaxing awareness so that awareness pervades the spaciousness, just as the clarity of the mirror pervades the whole surface of the mirror. It's not located in one place. As we looked yesterday, the, the ego is <clears throat> more like a searchlight or a torch or a spotlight. It illuminates a particular delimited area and it has a finite source point, whereas awareness is not located anywhere. Each moment when you are present with what is arising, it is as if you are located somewhere. But as the object goes, there's a space, and then a, a, an, another object or an experience arises, and it goes there. You don't need to move from A to B, for example, in this room. In order to see this wall, I turn my head, I see this wall. Now I can't see that wall, so I turn my head. So, if I want to gain the experience of that wall, I have to inevitably lose the experience of that wall. So I'm turning and turning and turning. And in that turning, I'm agitating myself. So this is, when we, when we are tracking thoughts, when we are caught up in thoughts, it's like... Um, an old kind of um, ford, you know, stepping stones across a river. Very often they're not in a very clear sequence. You have to sort of hop about from one to another and they might wobble a bit. And that's what we do. We go from one thought to another thought to another thought. And each thought we arrive at <coughs> locates us in a new positioning. So we're positioned here, positioned there, filled up with this emotion and not with, with, the, with another emotion. That's the nature of a dualistic involved consciousness. It's always somewhere and it's always up to something. Awareness is empty, open, revealing whatever's there without moving. And that's why we do this practice again and again, to see every time I seem to be somewhere and I've got it, if I stay relaxed and open, what I've got will vanish because there's nothing to get. This is why you can't get enlightened because enlightenment's not something to get. You can get better at learning French, you can get better at driving a car, you can get better at eating a manga with a knife and fork. There's all sorts of things you can develop skills in doing, but awareness itself is there from the very beginning. It's not a construct, it's not made up, up from your effort, it's not improved by good thoughts. It is self-existing. Everything else is not self-existing. That's why it's called Vajra, indestructible. Everything else in this world is destructible. The ordinary Tibetan world, word for this world is Jikpa, uh, Jikten, the place which, where <coughs> things are destroyed. Everything falls apart here. We don't want things to fall apart. Well, you're in the wrong place then. If you don't want things to fall apart, get off to Nirvana. Don't stay here. How do I get there? We don't know. Everything falls apart. We used to know. There was a bloke, Buddha. Hello. All he left was a statue. <laughs> we tried talking to the statue, but it doesn't say much. But nice red lipstick, though. <laughs> and, and this is a problem. Isn't it? How do we enter into communication with ourselves? That is to say, we start from the position: I am an individual self. I, me, myself. 
and I want to improve myself, I want to develop myself. This is the basis of a great deal of spiritual practice, physical yoga, tai chi and so on. If I try hard, I will get better. This is absolutely true in terms of developing qualities. For example, you might study the paramitas, you might study uh, Path of the Bodhisattva by Shantideva. It's very common to study that. And it shows you in detail, this is how to develop patience. These are the advantages of developing patience. These are the disadvantages of not developing patience. And with some thoughtfulness and effort, you can develop patience. But you cannot develop your Buddha nature. The Buddha nature is not a thing. You can develop your muscles, you can do exercises and your muscles will get bigger and stronger. But Buddha nature is not a muscle. Intelligence is a muscle. Refle our capacity for reflective rational thought, that's a muscle. Understanding of grammar, of literature, these are all things which if you invest focused energy, if you invest effort, you will get a result. There will be some benefit in that. Our ego self is like Latin grammar. If you attend to it and you work hard, you will gain a kind of mastery. You will be in charge of yourself. You will know the various contours and dispositions that your own individual self has. But that self does not have the key to enlightenment. No, ma no matter how hard you try, it will not open the door to enlightenment. That's just a fact. The ego is not necessarily part of the problem, but it is something whose real nature is revealed when you have the solution, but the one who has the solution is not the ego. This is quite difficult to understand, because then who gets enlightened? Enlightenment's already there. That is to say, at the moment that we are in this room, our awareness of the room, prior to thoughts about the room, the clarity which reveals the experience to us, is unchanging. For example, say you go up walking in the hills, trudging your way up a hill to get to the top. There's all this huge vista unfolding in front of you. And there's a moment in which there's no particular thoughts in your mind, you're just awestruck. Oh. Very little separation of subject and object. Subject and object arising together. You're part of the world. In the middle of nowhere you feel completely at home. That's the, the quality of awareness. Awareness is now revealing subject and object because subject's usual internal whirling of self-reference has been quieted by the awesomeness of the environment. And that leaves a space for the true illuminator to be revealed. The pseudo-illuminator is quiescent. The natural light of the mind now shows what is there. But it's not something you can think about. It's not something that you can write about in your diary. We have all these uh, marvelous romantic poets. Wordsworth, uh, in particular, spent hours and hours, thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours probably, trying to capture moments of the sublime. In German literature, Goethe and Schiller and so on, trying to catch the sublime. It's impossible. Because it's sublime, it's uncatchable. Why would you want to catch it? Better off going down the street giving people free bus tickets out to the Peak District. You know, because it is participative. That's what's really important, isn't it? It's participative. It is a quality of experience which is immediate, direct, and ungraspable. That's why it's unsayable. It can't come into language. 
when we talk in language, what we're doing is moving energy around. <coughs> the purpose of Dharma teaching is to try to <coughs> massage the uh, rigidity of our construct so that we loosen up inside in a way that allows us to dissolve and let go of the burden of our constructions so that we can just receive and be part of what's already there. It's not about building up a whole new battery of new cognitions. Dharma study can become counterproductive if we take an intellectualizing view of it. If, we give it, if it gets subsumed into the trajectory of power, that I can make myself a more powerful person, a more interesting person, I can become a, a Dharma teacher, I can do this, I can do that. All of that conceptualization then becomes a rigid skin around us because the intention is wrong. The basis of everything is emptiness. The heart of the Buddha's teaching is the absence of inherent self-nature. Whether you're reading that in the Theravadan text or you're reading it in Mahamudra and Sokshen, it's exactly the same. The unconditioned. In the Theravadan text, they talk a lot about <coughs> something being uh, beyond enumeration. That is to say, it is outside of arithmetic. It is, in modern uh, philosoph philosophical language, it is beyond totalization. Most discourses are totalizing discourses. They're discourses of mastery. You can master this subject, or if you understand this, you will see the whole circle. But totality means it can be God. Dzogchen is about infinity. Infinity is beyond accountancy. Accountancy may be a reasonable middle-class profession, but as a... <laughs> as a trope, as a symbol, it is absolutely poisonous. Because it's very important <coughs> to count the things that can be counted and not to try to count the things that can't be counted. There is no way to measure the extent or the dimension of the mind. Which is why um, when we do the practice, we look sometimes, what is the shape of the mind? How high is it? How wide is it? Where does it come from? Where does it stay? Where does it go to? When we take up these questions, just by sitting quietly and observing what's going on, and we try to find the size, the shape, the color, the basis, we come up with solution after solution after solution. Then we simply stay with the solution and observe. If it's the truth, it should remain, but it goes. Each of these solutions is the ego's appropriative, totalizing account. I have the answer. I have the answer. Then it's gone. It was just an opinion. It was just a fleeting moment. <coughs> that which remains, the unborn openness, inexpressible. You can't say it, but it's there. Whatever you can say, like the beginning of the Tao Te Ching, those who know don't speak, those who speak don't know. You can't speak about the central question. All our speaking is, as I was suggesting earlier, it's a kind of massaging of energy so that we can start to recognize energy is energy, the ground of energy is something else. If you take energy to have its own ground, then you have the solidification of the individual ego. I'm just me. That's who I'm. I'm just me. I've always been me. I was born me. You know, I've done lots of things in my life, but I'm just me. That is a totalizing. That is to say, I know what I am. It's a done deal. It's already accounted for. I have a sense of what's what. And it's interesting that that kind of statement is a proposition. The path of samsara is one of propositions, of statements, of answers. And all these answers are a kind of screen or a disguise which hides the real question. 
who am I? When we start to inquire, then we get close to what's there. When we speak and project and assume and give our totalized answers, we look powerful, we seem to be clear, but it's just an illusion. Because everything that we've constructed has gone. There is nowhere to arrive. You know, maybe you write something in your diary, you write an article, and it's all very clear and you're completely in that, and then it's gone. All constructions are impermanent. Buddha said these things many, many times. And when we observe it for ourselves, structures arise and then they pass. If we are weeping because they're passing, we're pissing in the face of the Buddha. We're saying, why are you right? Why can't I be right? It should be permanent. It should be permanent. But it's not permanent. It's not permanent. It just goes. We're sitting in this Dharma center. It arose due to causes and conditions. And it may end due to causes and conditions. That will be up to people's collective interest or energy to work out. But it is certainly a dynamic situation. It looks like there's a building which is existing, has a name and a title, and there's a charity, and there's a this and a that. All of these things are there, but they're there, held in place by little fine threads. If these threads get pulled or cut, everything can wobble. It's a puppet show. Everything is an illusion. It's a puppet show. Impermanence is not a punishment. It's not something dreadful. It's just how it is. That's it. That is the really central point. When you start to observe your own mind, you recognize every content of my mind, all the historical factors, all the tendencies, all the likes and dislikes out of which I construct my sense of self, all of these are impermanent as they arise and pass. On a meta-abstracted level, I have created a narrative which seems to endure through time, and when I fall asleep inside that bedtime story of the narrative of who I am, it appears that everything is just fine as it is. But that's a dream. Then something whacks us, we wake up, shocked. How, how could that be happening to me? How could it happen to me? Because I, I'm not like that. That, that should be somebody else's fate. Why is it mine? Something tears across our life. It's, this, is, this is the suffering of samsara. As the Buddha said, it arises from attachment. Attachment is the belief that patterns of energy are reliable, predictable, and solid enough to carry the weight of your sense of identity. It's an illusion. Now, it doesn't mean that there's nothing at all. It's not a nihilistic view. But the integration, relaxed openness, the whole field of whatever is arising, we just sit, eyes open, internal stuff, external stuff. Gradually, the more you do that, it, become, it, just, it just becomes dynamic. Instead of seeing fixed things, you become aware to the vibrant pulsation of energetic manifestation moment by moment and then at a certain point if you're doing the practice on your own your body starts to move you get up you make a cup of tea you phone someone all of that is the flow of energy it's not that I am making a cup of tea subject action object it's a flow and if the flow is happening inside the mirror of awareness Nothing has ever left the mirror of awareness. Samsara is not outside the ground of being. Samsara is a delusion inside the mirror. It's as if a reflection had enfolded another reflection. And so its clarity can't be seen. And it just unfolds and it's as it always was. We get wrapped up in something and then we unwrap. We know that as a person. Now, on a different level, we realize the one who was getting wrapped up is also a wrap. 
that we are nothing but folds of energy pulsating like seaweed in the ocean. These are the patterns of our lives. So the, the heart of uh, mindfulness in Dzogchen is to recall, to recollect, to remember, to relax into integration. Because our energy is wired up and we're so quickly reactive to what's going on, we spin into these endless vortices of invested meaning. This takes our fancy, that takes our fancy, we have to do that, oh my god, how could that... These are just like whirlwinds in the desert. The wind goes, shh, a bit of sand goes up in the air, then the wind drops, the sand falls, life goes on, suddenly there's calm after the storm. The more spacious we are, we can allow these winds to blow through. And then we start to see consciousness is a movement of energy within awareness. They're not separate categories. But the consciousness is the dynamic, energetic quality of awareness. Awareness reveals, it doesn't do. The energy of awareness arises as consciousness, as, as our participative energy. So, whenever we get lost, lost in believing that things are strongly real, taking events as very, very important, just relax. When you relax, you're back there. Samsara it's not a thing. It's not that we fell into samsara a long, long time ago, and now we're struggling to get to the end of it, like some hellish nightmare. Samsara, samsara begins and ends each second, each moment. A thought arises, you fall into it, there's samsara. The thought ends in that moment, there's a space. If you stay alive in the space, samsara's gone. Then you recognize, what? Well, just that. But if you fall into that, and then the next, and then the next, and then the next, each of these moments links together into this narrative of the continuity of me being me, I, me, myself. So, key aspect of Sokshin is to start to put oneself into question. Just to observe oneself and think, oh, what am I up to now? Whoa, here we go again. What was that all about? And just see, whoop, not blaming, but just observing. That we move here, we move there. These are our particular fixations. For some people it will be anxiety. For some it will be depression. For some it will be a kind of mania. For some it will be being a good girl. For some it will be working hard. For other people it will be getting wrecked and destroying their lives. These are all patterns. None of these patterns is inherently better than any other. In terms of the relative domain of social adaption, getting your acting gear, getting a job, getting a place to stay, that makes sense. In terms of the validity in, uh, of the event, in terms of its integration with the ground, it doesn't matter. So in the Indian tradition, you have the stories of the Mahasiddhas. Some of them lived on little islands with lots of dogs around them. They ran around barking like dogs. Some were drunk all the time. Some were very angry and fierce all the time. It doesn't matter what you do, because what you do doesn't define who you are. It only defines who you are in terms of social interaction. That is to say, other people, people who take themselves seriously, having their vision of how the world should be, they will interpret what you do and say, good people are very good, and bad people are very bad. Which is true. And general Mahayana teaching, Theravadan teaching of Shila, of morality, there are ten bad things, please don't do them. There are ten good things, please try to do them. Oh, what shall I do? Ah, I remember a good teacher told me there are ten good things to do. So what I will do is one of these ten good things. And if I do that good thing, I will be good. Hmm. Now I'm good. <laughs> and I've noticed that you are not good. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> That's a one way to pass one's life. <laughs> what is the basis of the good or the bad deed? Who is the one who is the actor? Of course, it's very important to be helpful and compassionate. But 
compassion can arise from various sources. There are different kinds of compassion. There's the compassion which is an intention to help beings. There's the compassion of actually helping people by doing Dharma practice. But there's a third kind of compassion called the, the compassion which is free of uh, reification or objectification. The compassion which doesn't take an object. And this is said to be uh, the most useful kind of compassion. That is to say, by staying relaxed and open in the mirror-like state, seeing that everything is an illusion, one moves, one's energy arises into the world as an illusion in a field of illusion. And therefore, all the interactions that we have with people are deconstructed. That is to say, they don't become something strongly real. We don't have a strong intention to help them, because in recognizing that all beings have been inseparable from the ground from the very beginning, there is nobody to be helped. But, because one is present with finesse, one meets each person with an absolute delicacy. One finds oneself being so close to them that they feel met and seen and heard. This is the function of compassion. It's not a doing towards others, but it's the openness of one's being that allows a very finessed co-emergence with the other. It doesn't require a particular intention. One's not attempting to do something for or to the other. But without thinking, without intention, some benefit arises because the other feels welcomed, seen. There is a space to be. Which yeah. practices help Relaxation. So not trying. Do you think it would just come from that relaxation? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think, the um, sort of integration with the precise. Absolutely. I mean, what, what would be, what would, is very helpful is to take a text, say, for example, the Heart Sutra, and study it in detail. Maybe form a study group to do that. Uh, the Heart Sutra sets out one of the basic teachings on emptiness. And if you see form is emptiness, emptiness is form, form is not other than emptiness. If you really see that, then when you see the form of a person, you, you see this is the form of emptiness. That is to say, this person is an illusion. And you do it with each of the five skandhas, and you can apply it to all the different building blocks. And when you really taste that, when you get it, it's an illusion. It's an illusion. This is a statue. This is just a bit of metal. Quite a costly bit of metal, no doubt. But anyway, it's a bit of metal. Now, why is this statue worth more than the basic metal? Because somebody's whacked it into shape, a shape that can hold your symbolic projections. And that's what costs you. The metal doesn't cost very much. Your fantasy about the metal, that's big bucks. That's what, you know, Barbie dolls are. It's a bit of plastic. But we girlies get to project an awful lot onto it. And they're always whining, I want a new one, I want a new one. And what are they getting? They're getting something that they've already got, which is a fantasy in their head. They can project it onto a bit of wood, which they would have done in the old days before you had plastic toys. <laughs> So it's once you, we actually start to see that, oh, the op every situation is an open potential. I bring into it my patterns, my pattern and the potential move together and create what? If you take it strongly real, it creates things. If you see the illusory nature, it creates nothing. It's just the reflection of the moon on water. If you really get that, that's the point where the, where the Buddha, in all these different texts, says, there is no death. There is no death because there is no birth. We have never been born. That is to say, we've never truly existed as things. We are simply a process of energy. That's why we can die so easily. You know, one wee knife and whack on your neck and <laughs> blood's everywhere and you're gone. One stone whacked on the top of your head and you're gone. Because we are an energetic system that's very vulnerable. That's what death is. So if we really existed, we'd be very difficult to, to kill. It'd be like Terminator or something. 
Yeah. You know, every time he's blasting away with that gun and big holes appear in the guy, he's back again. <laughs> We'd like to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> That, while we're learning, you know, while we're learning that finesse, it's kind of creates difficulties with other people who perhaps don't obviously kind of have that same understanding or feeling of the illusion, illusory nature of things. Sure, and, and that that's the big problem. That the basic request that comes to us from all the people we meet is, take me seriously. And from a Dharma point of view, that's the worst thing we could do. So it's like if you if you had a child who was a junkie and you say, Dad, give me some money. It's okay. If I give you the money, you're just going to whack it in your arm. How am I helping you? But Dad, I need a fix. But from their point of view, from the Dharma point of view, it is what? Yeah, what I need a fix. Them. Dad, come on. And they, and they get very frustrated. They do. Dad, I want a fix. And, and you want to maintain that. You said that before about the connectedness. It's very important. You need to maintain that connectedness. But if you can't, That's right. because you've got very good. Right. So then you do it in the manner of a dream. It's not that we're going to you know, stand on a soapbox and preach things to people without saying anything, without doing anything differently. You can do as they want, but you know that your speech is empty. So if you're doing a tantric practice, at the end we say, all that appears is the form of the deity, all sound is mantra, and everything which arises is the thought of the deity. So there is nothing there to grasp. And inside that, we, we carry out our role in the theatre of our own existence. So you talk to, you know, an old person in one way, a small child in another, to an employer in one way, and so on. So you don't have to say to them, you've got life wrong. You know, we're not kind of Mormons knocking on the door. It's not taking the good news to anyone. But by your being relaxed, maybe they'll notice something. It's a very subtle movement. The story of Padmasambhava is that Padmasambhava is the great uh, saint, the great yogi, there's a statue of him there, uh, who went to Tibet and introduced the uh, full power of uh, Tantric Buddhism. And they say that when he left, he left on a magic horse, which is always a good thing to do. <laughs> Probably more reliable than the train I'll be getting this afternoon. <laughs> And he flew off on this magic horse down to an island called uh, Chamaradvip, which is probably modern Sri Lanka. And in this island, uh, it was an island inhabited by very ferocious beings called Rakshasas. And the king was a very, very fierce and uh, dangerous person. So when Padmasambhava arrived, he arrived at night and the king was sleeping. And he went into the bedroom of the king, and through his meditation, he knocked the king's consciousness out into a pure land and merged his existence into that of the king. So the next morning, the courtiers brought in whatever they bring in, English breakfast tea, <laughs> for the demon king. <laughs> and the demon king was there, but it was Padmasambhava. And... <laughs> started in his grumpy manner but gradually month by month year by year he became a little bit softer the people around him gradually got used to him being a little bit softer and eventually it was all very nice <laughs> and they were all invited to the Queen's garden party <laughs> so that that's that's a nice example of, of how to do it not suddenly confronting say I've got the good news or it's all wrong but by altering our behavior, because we are interactive beings, this infinity loop of communicative interaction is going to be altered if one of the polarities is softening and releasing itself. So without even saying anything, a mood of movement and dynamism is introduced. Okay, should we do uh, a bit of that meditation again and that will bring our brief time together to an end. <clears throat> so we're just sitting, <coughs> relaxed, open way, gazes into the space in front of us, relaxing into the space, then whatever arises, let it come. If you feel bored and stupid, if you feel you can't meditate, <coughs> allow that thought to be there. 
and observe what happens. If you fall into the thought, you'll have a whole chain of thoughts. If you just relax and be present with the thought, see what happens. Keep seeing that. Whenever you get caught in something, whenever you seem to have found an answer or have a definition, just be with it. See what happens. I suggested earlier, <clears throat> that's a kind of practice you can do short periods of time and gradually get more used to it. Um, in terms of details of uh, how to deal with problems in the meditation, on the website Simply Being, there are transcripts of talks that describe that. Also the book Simply Being is going to be reprinted in the spring and there are texts by Pata Rinpoche and so on which deal with the meditation problems. <coughs> the key thing is simply to really try to receive deep inside yourself the notion that everything is pure, everything is open, everything is okay. And when problems or difficulties arise, don't take them too seriously. Just sit with them and observe them arising and passing that these are communications or messages. They require a response. How will you respond? The more spacious you are, the, the more connected you are with the infinity of your potential, with all your knowledge and wisdom, what is required comes to hand and you engage with it. Worrying, over uh, thinking, ratiocination, troubling yourself again and again with things, leads to an, a narrowing of vision and an increase in anxiety which again further feeds a narrowing of our capacity to think. It's in many ways uh, seems almost counterintuitive to us that relaxation is better than mobilization. We live in a culture which is absolutely addicted to the notion of mobilization. Something must be done. From this point of view all energy is arising effortlessly from the source and the over-identification of oneself as an actor or an agent is actually an interference with the easy flow of connective movement between all phenomena. So it, it is a profoundly different way of understanding experience. I've personally found it very helpful in my life and I think it's a useful thing to try but it is about trying it. Don't worry about getting it wrong because no error is enormously important. Mistaking occurs all the time. If you mistake something, you just let go of it, take something else. And then gradually you get used to not taking anything. But actually, as you relax and open, many things are coming to you. It is the return to the Garden of Eden. A time before ploughing, before hewing wood, pulling water, where everything is just there. Who is, who is the one who brings it? No one. What is brought? Nothing. These things are very sweet, very beautiful. So, practicing every day if you can, short periods of time, not taking yourself too seriously, not taking other people too seriously, but being very present. Being mindful means being in the movement of the world as it changes moment by moment. Not being afraid of change, but working with change. Not being afraid of change doesn't mean just throwing everything into the wind and letting things dissolve. Because whatever is built up 
it's not so much the thing that is built up, but that is that uh, movement has been created by collaborative energy. And collaborative energy is very beautiful. That's one thing that could perhaps save this planet from the way human beings are. So here we have a, a, a Dharma center. For it to thrive, for it to manage to continue in whatever form, will involve collaboration. And that involves being very clear about what the task is. And if the task can be clarified, and people can attend to the task rather than attending to their own uh, natures and personalities and likes and dislikes, it's possible for things to go well. But if everybody stays in their own individual bubble and their own point of view, collaboration will be very difficult. And that's likely to lead to an unhelpful outcome. The practice always has these different aspects. The basic openness, the hospitality to everything that arises without judgment, and then the precise movement moment by moment into the emerging field. And whatever has been done wrong, whatever mistakes have been made, are not so important. There is the next moment, and the next moment, if we stay connected. If we decide to say, uh-oh, I've had enough of this, then there is nothing to be done. Slicing is very quick, but that's the, uh, the energy field of anger. So it's not about fusion, it's not about cutting off, it's about flexible staying connected with things, so that participative energy allows more possibilities of growth and development for many people. So, now we can just <laughs> dedicate any merit arising from our time together. We can imagine out from our hearts rays of light stream to all sentient beings in all the different realms. Gewan di nyodun da ujjan lama drujjan e Droa chi chama lupa Dei sala ke pashu So, we come to the end. Thank you very much for inviting me here and for participating so well. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to all the organizers, Charles for doing the recording, and everybody for their own particular ways of joining. So, good luck. Bye. Thank you.